Wonderful. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone back. Thank you for um, joining us today for the Transportation Commission meeting. Uh, we are not without topics to discuss, and uh, the energy around transportation in Oregon is just at a height that I'm excited to be a part of. Um, we have Kat Silva who's here to talk with us. I know we're going to abbreviate. Um, we have the um, discussion with our legislators. So let's go ahead and abbreviate down the uh, where we are in terms of the implementation of House Bill 2017. Two-minute version, and then we'll get right into it with our legislators. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners Cherbini. Um, as uh, Cherbini mentioned, my name is Kat Silva. I'm the Hospital 2017 uh, Implementation Project Manager here at ODOT, and I am presenting to you the September uh, monthly implementation uh, status report. Uh, I just want to call for your attention um, some changes in the formatting, which is based on some feedback that uh, I've I heard was mentioned at the uh, last meeting in John Day and the meeting previous to that. Um, just wanting a bit more detail about the goings on within the agency related to these work efforts uh, each month. And then also, um, so you'll notice that on the first page, um, we've added some elements to give. Do we have a graphic of the dashboard or anything for folks to see? No. Okay, that's all right. No, no, sorry, sorry. We do. Okay, sorry. Um, there should be. Do you have copies too in the back? Okay, go right ahead. Okay. Um, I apologize. Uh, so you'll notice on the first page, um, there's just a bit more detail about ongoing efforts, what you're going to be seeing in front of you this month related to the House bill um, on your agenda, and then also what you'll be seeing next month on your agenda. Um, there will likely be more items on the agenda next month than just the two that I've highlighted below, but those are kind of the two um, biggest work efforts uh, that are coming at you at the October workshop. Okay. And then um, the next thing you'll notice is that throughout the report, I added some information, some detail um, for the initiatives, uh, identifying some of the risks, uh, key risks and mitigation strategies that we have uh, deployed uh, to combat those risks in an effort to show you that um, even though things are reading green, uh, there we are, that doesn't mean that it's not without some attention to these uh, things that could throw us off at any moment and um, some strategizing on ways to avoid getting off track. And so um, it's my hope that by providing you with that detail um, that you'll have a bit more insight as to how we are um, attacking this work and, um, and the things that are on our radar in doing so. Okay. Okay. And then, so um, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions with relation to those um, either here or offline. And then I also have on the last, the very last page is your uh, latest update on where we're at with staffing and the recruitment efforts for the House Bill 2017 positions. Excellent. And so you'll recall you got an update in July. Um, we had several positions come on board since then, and then, um, and so this is our latest and current information. Okay. So that's it. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I wanted to have uh, our legislators have an opportunity to see how we're tracking the progress of 2017. So, Kat, I think we will just uh, lean on you if necessary. Yeah. I'll kind of give the nod, but if we could welcome our legislators up. And um, you can see where we are in terms of uh, monitoring and tracking. We had the opportunity to break bread and share lunch together. So the process, <laughs> yes. I get to see a Lee Byer here. So oh. There you go. I'm in charge for three minutes. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Please. Chair Bainey, members of the commission, for having us here today. I'm Caddy McHugh, and I represent House District 9 down on the south coast, and I'm the vice chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation and Modernization. Um, I, I, Senator Meyer had to step out, and, and I think on his behalf and on behalf of all of us who sat on the entire committee and, and, and brought House Bill 2017 to you, um, we want to thank you for the, uh, the lion's share of work. You have done an amazing job. We threw a lot at you. This is huge, enormous, large, difficult, complex, um, all of those things, but incredibly important to the citizens of Oregon. And um, it's been a pleasure today to have a bit of time to have conversations with you um, just about how, how, um, how complex this is and the work that you're all doing and taking very seriously to make sure it's implemented properly. Uh, and on behalf of Senator Beyer and myself and everyone else, thank you, I think is the message we want to give you today. Even just seeing a document like this as to how complex just the implementation and the tracking is is pretty is remarkable. 
Um, I think my colleagues just have a couple of very brief words to say. We know that we've gotten you behind schedule already and we'd like to have you get caught up, but um, uh, it's a delight to work with each one of you. And um, on the behalf of the citizens of Oregon, I don't know how we're gonna thank mm -hmm. you for the, 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 eight, the next seven years that are coming up and um, uh, the, the wonderful work that you will continue to do with ODOT to make sure that, that um, all, of the, all of the things that we are requiring you are being done and being done well and being done uh, with a great deal of accountability and being done efficiently and uh, with an eye towards how every single tax dollar gets spent because those are the things that we hear about. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for having us today. Um, I'd, one of the things that I wanted to touch on very briefly that I touched on, um, I keep touching on before, is there were four areas of implementation for this package and I was the chair of the Connect Oregon, the multimodal f the, uh, the committee and uh, work group. And I just wanna make sure that as we move through with the, the reload projects and the other two projects that were um, assigned during this process, uh, that we don't lose sight of the fact that we really don't have a long-term plan for coming back to a place where we are fully funding the Connect Oregon projects that we were doing in the past. So as we move forward, we'll continue to have emphasis on that, uh, make sure that that's one thing that was not quite complete in 2017, and that's the one thing that I will continue to make sure that we're talking about. So um, on that note, I'm gonna turn to my colleagues to let them also comment, but thank you so much for your work. We appreciate it greatly. Uh, Mr. O'Halloran, best of luck in the next chapter of your life. Uh, thank you for your dedication to this project and thank you for your vision on congestion pricing and where we're going with um, with, with the issues around congestion. Um, um, it's, it, you, you've set the stage and we're delighted by that. Um, but we wish you well and look forward to welcoming a new commissioner soon. So thank you for your work, sir. Senator, go ahead. No, we'll let you go. No, 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 I insist. You know, I gotta tell you, we need to do that. <laughs> you can take that one. No, <laughs> we can make a new one. <laughs> I, uh, thank you. My name is Andy Olson. I'm state representative from the uh, Albany area, and um, I have less than four months left of my 14th year. So, but uh, anyways, I really do appreciate this opportunity, and especially this last few years that we've had a chance to work in transportation. Uh, for that area. I mentioned it earlier during our lunch break and everything, but I just do one more time. I want to say it on the record. Uh, and it's a shout out for you. I, I greatly appreciate the commission mm -hmm. for stepping out and supporting the idea of congestion, price, congestion pricing and also the tolling issue. I, I mean, it's a bigger vision than what we anticipate what it's all about. It's, it's also safety. So I just want to say thank you for that one more time. And I'm going to stop right there. Great. I am Brian Boquist. Um, I'm the Joint Committee Vice Chair. I'm right here. And there's nobody with enough money to recall me, so I'm here for two more years. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to cover a couple of points uh, on behalf of Senator Beyer and myself, uh, mostly for the record. Uh, I, I too want to compliment the commission and, uh, and ODOT staff and the director for leaning forward on a lot of these issues here. Uh, Patrick Brennahan, our own staff, who spent months in the cave with us, this is to my back career. Uh, I asked him for our next committee meeting that we have in the legislature to put a couple documents up there. One of them uh, he, he tracked down with Paul uh, when Paul was actually a real full-time employee at ODOT versus, I don't know, a consultant or whatever he is. Uh, and, uh, and, and I want to talk about that briefly because I think it's the vision going forward that the, two, that, that the commission so far has put forth and I just want to remind you that you are in good stead. The first document that he put up for our own committee is the history of the interstate system in the state of Oregon. I think, you know, I come from four decades of government service uh, wearing a uniform and I think you know that President Eisenhower uh, initiated the interstate system under a wartime footing in a Department of Defense, Department of War instrument. And ODOT at that time, which wasn't called ODOT then, actually stepped up and we built the interstate system, not quite as fast as the Alcan Highway, but we did it in a remarkable feat of time and speed. And so we have an ODOT staff and now an ODOT commission that has the capability to move a lot faster than we've ever moved in the past. Uh, and legislature's tried to give you the tools. 
If you've not read of the history of how many bridges and how fast we did it compared to some of the rhetoric we see floating out where it takes six or eight or 10 years to do something, uh, in that time frame, we built hundreds of bridges and hundreds and hundreds of miles of road. I will also remind you that in the great American tradition, we had people from Oregon that helped build the Alcan Highway. And that document, built in 1942, is being put up on the legislative website too. And I point that out to you because in a record amount of time, we built a 900-mile road. And what most of you don't know is after the war, in a record amount of time, we paved and rebuilt the bridges across Canada to the state of Alaska. The reason I bring these points up to you is, is, is uh, you have adopted a statewide transportation strategy. You're implementing the uh, House Bill 2017. And one of the things that we need to communicate is that we have the greatness that we used to have. And we're not restricted by time. We're restricted by obstacles we have to overcome. And so when we start communicating out there to a we, to our constituents, and to you, I just want to remind you that we can do great things. And the fact of the matter is, is rather than saying this takes two, four, six, eight years, you know, we develop timelines for our process and our project management, but we convince the public that our actions are going to be louder than our words. And so we don't start delaying and saying this is going to take a long time, so on and so forth like that. In that communications realm, we talked about privately, and uh, Senator Byron and I both raised a couple of issues. I would ask you, and you don't need to comment today because you have other businesses, but I'd ask you, and we've talked about, we need to do a better job both as legislators and OTC and the department in communicating what's inside the statewide transportation strategy. I mean, there is a perception out there, it's status quo. And what we want to ensure is that people understand we're really pushing forward with capacity building, with expansion. Capacity does include things like transit and more rail, everything from more lanes and everything else. And so we've kind of created this image out there in the public that we, the legislators, have to deal with by not being clear in what is inside these, uh, these plans. Likewise, I think we all know that, you know, there is a difference between, despite a ballot measure that I've told you privately and I've been saying public that, okay, this follows federal law, so great, pass it, I'm okay. Uh, uh, that there is a difference between tolling, which is capacity adding, and value pricing, which is congestion relief and things like that. And that what we're really trying to do is we need to add capacity. And I point out to you, even in the greenhouse gas admissions, which Senator Byer will be voting on one side, of course, in the session, I'll be voting on the other. Uh, but having said that, the fact remains that even when we go to autonomous electric vehicles, the safety functions that we are all concerned about on the highways will set those vehicles up in a matter in which the actual spacing that, you know, Matt's people put out in their book of, you know, one length for every 10 miles an hour and five lengths, that will actually be in the computer system and we'll actually do that. And I just want to point out too, we will actually have to have more capacity on the road just to have the autonomous electric vehicles we're all talking about in 20 years from now that create a safe travel environment that's out there. And so it is adding capacity, does have greenness to it, but I think we need to do a better job combined between us of communicating you know, what, what is out there when we're talking about Rose Quarter I-205, that we are actually talking about capacity in some of this verbiage that's out there. I do want to put on the record so, so there's clear intent, and I will look for the nod from my two colleagues to the right here. Um, there's been some discussion and interesting topics raised on the transit portion of House Bill 2017. And once again, it is not a status quo piece. That is a capacity expansion piece in transit, meaning we're trying to expand transit out into underserved areas, rural areas, and things like that. Uh, there shouldn't be any confusion of that. I know the commissioners don't have any confusion of that, but I just want to make sure that that's on the public record. Uh, the last thing that we want to address is, is that we are pushing forward. Uh, it was raised by the good chair. Um, multimodal facilities that are out there, which were part of Connect Oregon. Um, the importance of being able to connect those with Class 1 railroads in order to get containers off of the highways and onto the nationwide rail system is, is important as we go forward. And I'll leave you with one final point is, is that uh, we knew that we'd have to do a corrective bill for 2019. Uh, we actually did the corrective bill and decided we need to do a corrective corrective bill. And so I just leave you with this. If there are issues that come up to the commission over the next you know, three or four months as we go into the legislative session, I think all of us know we'll have to do a corrective bill to 2019. And if there's you know, technical fixes that need to be done in there or clarifications, please do not hesitate to reach out. 
uh, either directly to the four of us with here, Senator Byer here to my left, not often he's to my left, but that's okay, uh, and, uh, and to Patrick in the back so that we know what those are and we are happy to be supportive of you, whether it's simply planning clarification, whether it's providing political top cover or what it is. Please do not be bashful that. I know you're going to have the opportunity to be before our committee yes, next we week. Uh, so if you have a laundry list already, we're happy to receive it next week. And with that, thank you again. And Madam Chair, if I might just add. <clears throat> there, there we, we go. go. Madam Chair, if I might just add, Commissioners, um, Senator Boquist is absolutely correct. This is, a, this is a living, breathing thing that we have created. And we know that it's going to continue to meet adjustment along the way. We put an eight-year plan together. This is a 50-year plan. We are just starting down a road that's going to lead us in a, in a very significant different direction. So um, drafting earlier rather than later is always helpful, particular to, particularly the people that are downstairs in the basement helping us with these things. Uh, and on the transit side, I want to um, thank you, Senator, for, for talking about the, the important message that we want to get out there on the transit piece. When we put that piece in there, it is, it is not status quo. This is not just funding operations. This has to be capacity building. Um, I come from rural communities, and it's already having a tremendous effect in allowing smaller communities to be better connected. And we, we anticipate that these entities that are providing these services will put their heads up and look around and begin to see ways that they can collaborate differently as time goes on. And that's really an important piece of what we were trying to encourage them to do. And um, I, I think the, the, the last thing I want to say is the partnership with you all between the four of us and the rest of our committee is solid. We are here to have your back. We want to support everything that you're trying to do. So please know uh, that you have our, our, our solid support on the issues that you are stepping out on, on our behalf and on behalf of the citizens of Oregon. So again, thank you for your wonderful work, and we're delighted to be here today. Thank you. I have a few comments too. Um, okay, so I first thank you so much for making the time to be with us today, but also for your commitment going forward. Our job is the policy, and we leave the politics to you, which is uh, for <laughs> us as we, one of the things that we have really engaged and embraced is the fact that we've been going slow for many, many years in Oregon because we haven't had the vision and we haven't had the funding. And so for us, going slow is something that was for yesterday. We want to be moving forward. And so you will see us probably going a bit beyond what may be the comfort zone for some. I think it was stated best earlier uh, by Commissioner O'Halloran who said that um, we can't embrace the status quo. Our job is to continue to push forward. We have a responsibility to provide a safe and efficient transportation system for Oregonians. And that means that we need to have bold leadership in setting those policies and moving forward. Uh, we are committed to Connect Oregon as we get around the state and hear from our smaller communities and from other partners. That funding being dedicated right now to great projects uh, is leaving a hole in some of the ability for those other partners to move forward with some of their expansion and vision options. So um, that is a commitment for us as well in making sure that that funding goes forward. Um, I want to call to your attention something that we have um, just recently started doing, and this is uh, with uh, Director Garrett as well. We are now meeting with DLCD, D, uh, DEQ, Department of Energy as well, with their commissions and breaking bread, similar to what we just did, because some of those barriers that, Senator, you just brought up, um, those are self-inflicted. And so those are things that we have created. And so how do we move forward in addressing transportation and the economy, really, in Oregon, collectively, and playing to our strengths in terms of each one of those agencies? So that is something that we've started doing as well, and I think um, it's bearing some pretty good fruit. Great. So with that, I turn it to my colleagues and see if you have any other comments. Please. Um, I just want to thank you and thank the Joint Committee One for um, being very bold and um, leading and, and getting the legislation enacted. Um, and it was no small feat in this political environment, um, no small feat in this um, budgetary climate. So um, I, I, you have done a lot to empower the Commission. Um, you've done you've given us a lot of tools to move forward, and I think we have tried to take it very seriously and to um, to use the tools you've given us and to improve the quality of life for, for Oregonians. Um, I think it goes back to the vision uh, panel work that was done, which was really intended to look at all the regions of the state and all the modes of it, 
all the needs, whether it was seismic or transit or congestion. Um, but and I think Senator it is appropriate that you refer to Eisenhower and he built the interstate system as the interstate and defense highway system. And it was with the acknowledgement that we couldn't have healthy citizens if we couldn't get them to the best health care. Um, we couldn't move commerce if we couldn't move commodities that are only grown in Oregon to other parts of the country, et cetera. Um, and we couldn't defend our country if we couldn't um, move from point A to point B to, to for wherever that threat was. So his vision was, was clearly in place. I think it's um, fitting that the work that you did at the legislature um, is really an extension of that, right? Looking at the economic mm -hmm. vital vitality and, and people don't want to sit in traffic, right? And if we are not dealing with expansion of our system at creating new capacity, at creating freight corridors to move the goods and products um, that Oregon produces to markets uh, within the United mm -hmm. States and, and, and abroad, um, we, are, we are hurting our economy. So I, I think as we look at congestion pricing, it's not an easy thing to do. Nobody wants to pay more um, for the same thing. But most people are willing to pay more if they get more. And if you can create the vision if you can create a vision of less congestion, if you can create a, a vision of, of our economy growing, more things getting to market more expeditiously, I think people are willing to contribute to that because they get the return on investment. And I think that if, if tolling and congestion pricing is viewed as a tax for the same uh, frustration, uh, it will fail. Um, if, if we are using it, it's, these systems are expensive, as you well know, um, and, and none of it is free. Um, you, you, have, you have pulled all the levers for producing revenue, whether it's vehicle registration, licensing, fuel tax, you've pulled every lever there is to pull. Um, this is one that remains for us to, to address, right? And it's, it is the only one that captures the true wear and tear on the system. Um, but we've got to take whatever we yield from it and reinvest it into the system to create capacity, which ultimately is making our economy grow and improving people's quality of life. So uh, I just want to end. Um, we do need to get the word out there. I think um, our partnerships with the major stakeholders, whether it be trucking or rail or, or um, going by waterways, uh, we, we need to keep these conversations going and looking at all the options and expanding um, high occupancy vehicles and carpooling and maybe we have a ferry system in place, but I think we, you know, we need to put it all on the table, but um, I, I don't think we would be anywhere near where we are right now if you had not done what you did at the legislature. Um, and if we were looking at a ballot measure, we would be nowhere. Um, we would be just spooling up for a big election issue. So um, the fact that you did what you did without referral is, is really re remarkable, right? Because it allowed, and, and what we've done now, we want to go faster, but we would be nowhere if it had been referred. We'd be nowhere if you had not done that. We'd be kind of just miring in, and it would be the status quo. But So uh, thank you for giving us the tools to move forward. I, I want to second those comments and, and just thank you all again for your bold work and leadership in this capacity. Um, there, it's, it's funny how we keep having this conversation around the different jargon of, of what the issue is, the decongestion pricing, congestion pricing, value pricing, tolling, whatever you want to refer to it as. The definition is that we have a problem, and it's a traffic problem. And I think that is the, the message that needs to resonate amongst everybody. And, um, and we also have a funding problem. As we are dealing with an archaic system, as it relates to the gas tax model that is slowly dying off, aging infrastructure with high needs, the feds have checked out, and we have neighbors that were invited to a picnic but didn't show up, right? <laughs> and so I don't know what we're going to do about this fast-growing metropolitan region, but we obviously have to solve for the problem that exists today and what we can anticipate for being problems in the future because, as Commissioner O'Halloran has articulated, this definitely comes back to our economy and ensuring that we can actually move products and goods around efficiently and effectively. And um, even though 
this dialogue is really about money because it's all about the investments that we have to make and also those are paying into it and being able to articulate and justify that ROI. I think that's the most important message that has to get conveyed to the public so they can understand what is their return on investment. And lastly, I just wanted to encourage folks to think about if, if something significant happened in our region, let's just say something similar to what's taking place in the Carolinas right now, and we were forced to work together, we would have no other option, right? All the politics, all the difference of opinions, all the personal agenda agendas would be set aside and we would find a way to work together to rebuild our ecosystem and our communities. And I think that's how we have to look at it because we are dealing with a state of emergency around our transportation network. And until we get to that place, um, we're gonna just obviously have to keep jumping through hurdles. But I commend you and your leadership and I encourage you to even think bolder as we get out through this package and start looking at the bigger plan even going forward into that those 50 year visions and plans. So again, thank you and appreciate you guys being here. We will see you Tuesday. Chair Bainey, if yes, I may, I would please. be remiss if I didn't make one more very, very brief comment. Okay. Um, when we when, when the presiding officers put this commission or this this committee together, I had a vice chair. It was it was Representative Bentz, and he was stalwart in in working through this process for more than a year, year and a half. And then he left us and moved over to the Senate. And I need to thank my colleague, Representative Olson, for stepping into this vice chair role um, graciously with a great deal of effort he got himself up to speed very very quickly uh and it's been a joy to work with you representative and i just want to thank you for your service and 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 for the record let everyone know that i will miss representative olson when he leaves this body in yes. how many months four months three months but it goes it, it goes without saying that he he stepped in he did the job he's done a wonderful job and i've enjoyed working with him and and he he was called and he served and and i'm delighted that that you um joined us in this position representative so thank you thank you yes and thank you for your leadership on the accountability side as well it was a joy to work with you and maybe we do move the commission to seven which would offer an opportunity for you to sit in this perfect right exactly <laughs> Please. How's yes. your heart there, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Kat, did you feel that you were able to give us what you needed? Please, go right ahead. It's one of the pieces that keeps me up at night, so I... Good afternoon again, Commissioners Trevini. Um, I just want to give a moment to, for you all to be able to ask questions and respond and react to um, the update on the status of recruitment. Um, given that it's been two months since you've seen any detail about um, where we're at with recruiting for the positions, and um, we've I've broken it out a bit differently this time um, to give a bit more on the, the distinction between filled and active recruitments, because last time we grouped those together. I don't know how this really plays in exactly, but I'm wondering, um, are all positions considered to be long-term positions or do we have limited duration positions that are also captured in here? Yes. And yes. So, if so is that something that as we go forward that maybe we should be looking at, you know, as we complete projects or certain types of lines of business that are part of the implementation, um, I, just in this conversation around transparency of communication, mm -hmm. do we maybe want to sort that out to kind of show that these are the positions that are more limited duration and these are the positions that are more uh, part of just the ongoing work that's going to be in front of us? Yeah, Madam Chair, if I may, and Kat, please jump in because you're, you're going to be at the tip of the spear of this. But yeah, I think that's, that's more than uh, legitimate to put on the table. There is an ebb and flow. Of, uh, of positions and the durations, and we should note that. And again, we know as we continue to move forward, uh, as programs as well as projects come online, we'll see another wave of, uh, of FTE, uh, be they uh, 
full-time or temporary dependent on the charge given to them. So I think the ability to capture that ebb and flow, I know we have that information. I don't think that's onerous, but no. I defer to you. So. Yeah. No, we do have that information, and I can absolutely splice the, splice the data that way so you, I can show you what we've filled that are limited duration and when certain things come on board and go offline, so to speak. To the general public, mm -hmm. it's an important distinction. Um, I, I would look, at my, look to my colleagues to wonder if you also see that as a factor. Um, I wouldn't want to be in the discussion of, well, ODOT just added X amount of employees, and, and but they are in categories of work streams, not necessarily just peppered everywhere. So um, if we need to go to the legislature and request in certain lines of, of our operation, that might offer better clarity to the general public about where those positions are and what the intention is of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Uh, <clears throat> um, for the position, so this 162 is what actually has been filled ever since the installation of HB 17. Uh, Commissioner Simpson, yeah, th that's correct. Okay. Um, <laughs> what percentage of those individuals are actually from this state? That is a really good question. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can find out. Okay. I was just curious as how far the outreach is going. Is it going outside of the state? I would assume it is, but I'm just curious as to who's attracted to this area based on these positions. Um, so I know that we have um, we have gone out of state um, to networking events and conferences, and uh, we've been publicizing these the open positions at those events. Um, and I know that we've targeted specific areas. I don't recall off the top of my head what those states are, but I can find out and get that information to you. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments on the dashboard? Okay. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. No problem. All right. Next, let's have uh, it's an action item, and we are going to have a discussion about Connect Oregon, the Port of Moro dedicated project within House Bill 2017. And good to see this come forward. Eric, great to see you. Thank you, Chair Benny and uh, members of the Commission. For the record, Eric Havig, I'm the Planning Section Manager for ODOT. And uh, the timing on this is really good, given that you just had the conversation around House Bill 2017 implementation. I'm bringing forward for you one of the first actions out of Connect Oregon uh, for uh, your approval to move that project forward. So as you recall, out of House Bill 2017 and the Connect Oregon program, the legislature dedicated four specific projects to be funded out of that program. Uh, there's an intermodal facility in the Treasure Valley area, an intermodal facility in the Mid Willamette area, uh, the UP siding project around Brooks, and the Port of Morrow project. Uh, the Port of Morrow uh, has completed their project plan. This is in requirements to uh, the Connect Oregon rules that you adopted uh, last fall and became finalized over the spring. Each, each uh, project sponsor to get money out of the dedicated program had to complete a project plan outlining what their project would entail, how they would get the project done, and covering what the benefits and outcomes of that project would be. The Port of Morrow submitted theirs in early July. Uh, we have gone through the review both internally inside ODOT staff as well as the Business Oregon, our sister agency, uh, to review the project plan. Uh, you have recommendation letters from both the director of ODOT as well as director of Business Oregon. It's also been reviewed by the uh, Freight Advisory Committee uh, with a letter of recommendation from the Freight Advisory Committee to move this project forward. So we are here asking you to approve the project and approve ODOT and the director to move forward into entering into an agreement with the Port of Moro to construct the East Beach uh, Rail Access Project. And I'll entertain any questions. Well, I think this is a milestone, so let's acknowledge that. And I think it is a really important improvement project in terms of um, the mobility of goods in that area. Um, I mean, I just, if I, someone had asked me 20 years ago, well, what's going to happen out of the port? I mean, it just would not look like this. And so I'm excited this is before us. Do we have any questions that help to clarify in order to be able to move this forward? All right, if not, I'd welcome a motion. Madam Chair, I move the approval of the Connect Oregon Port of Moro. Uh, project in the approval for the Oregon Department of Transportation staff to enter into a Connect Oregon construction intergovernmental agreement with the Port of Morrow. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yes.
And uh, Director Garrett, because we have one member who's going to be leaving early and we have one abstention on the consent calendar, do you think that it might be good for us to go ahead and move the consent calendar up and get that out of the way? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Okay. <laughs> do we feel ready to move forward on the consent calendar? Okay. That way we would have um, you got a table one? the appropriate number of individuals for any other votes throughout the afternoon in case, uh, Commissioner Simpson, you needed to leave early. So I do believe that we have one item on the consent agenda that uh, will require a potential conflict. And so uh, Vice Chair Van Brocklin, if you'd like to outline that, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, my law firm represents uh, uh, TriMet uh, on various matters, and therefore I am going to recuse myself from uh, the I-205 Johnson Creek Glen Jackson Bridge Phase 2 project dot number 9447-001. Okay, so that would oh. take, so okay. go right ahead. So if I can offer the following, if we can um, actually uh, vote specifically on consent calendar item number three, specific to file 9447-001, the I-5 Johnson Creek Glen Jackson Bridge Phase 2, I would ask the commission to support that, acknowledging uh, Commissioner Van Brocklin will recuse himself from deliberation and votes. Okay, so I would welcome a motion as outlined by the director. So moved. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. We have uh, a recusal. I abstain. I abstain. Okay. I think with that, Madam Chair, and um, having no other conflicts or concerns um, broached specific to the remainder of the consent calendar item, items plural, I would ask that the commission um, approve the remaining consent calendar items. Okay. Uh, so moved. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right, we are free for the afternoon and we will continue on with our regularly scheduled um, meeting. Next we have an update on the DMV uh, Division Service Transformation Program. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Madam Chair, I, I uh, beg your indulgence and I actually apologize to, to Mr. McClellan and Mr. Kahn. I have to exit uh, for some family business and I would ask, Madam Chair, if you're comfortable, I'd ask uh, Mr. Brower to come up and take the seat and uh, steer the ship. Yes. Please let us know how the college atmosphere is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just grateful that you're uh, taking this time Thank to you, do that, Chair. please. And good luck. Thank you, sir. Good luck, Matt. We are not going to do the toga chant. No toga. <laughs> so, Tom, I do hope that you brought a lot of questions for the assistant director. Oh, that's right. Uh, yes. <laughs> Certainly. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, for the record, my name is Tom McClellan, a DMV administrator. Uh, with me is... Hi, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Ben Kahn, transformation manager, DMV. We're, we're, we're going to tag team this. Uh, ben will handle uh, most of the uh, service transformation program, or STP. We might slip in occasionally, uh, and I'll I'll cover at the end a little bit of information about an online open house that we did to help us kind of chart our future. So, I'll let Ben take it away. All right. Can we go to the next slide? Oh, we have it someplace. Okay. Awesome. There you go. So this is our most recent quality assurance report from CSG Government Solutions, our quality assurance vendor. You can see that we're mostly green currently. Uh, this goes along with where Matt's going in a few minutes here. They're, they're mostly right. green in, at U of O right. as well. Right. Uh, STP went from a medium overall risk rating to a low rating in July in our report, and we're trending towards less risk on our project. Uh, low rating means that we're on track and we have just minor issues to deal with. On the next slide, you can see that spending uh, was just over $12 million during the 2015-2017 biennium, including buying the FAST DSVS software. Total spent on STP is expected to reach $50 million over the next two years. Total spending during the 10 years is $90 million. We've been very busy over the last six months. Uh, we've been testing configured parts of our system. Uh, that began in August. 
Subject matter experts have written more than 4,000 test scenarios for us to test to make sure the system works properly when we go live. We have trained our staff on um, the FAST methodology of training. Too many to advance if you could oh, yeah. on that. There we go. Awesome. So we have the uh, FAST training academy that just occurred, and we have 12 trainers. They're using a train-the-trainer approach. So we're training DMV trainers, and then they'll train the rest of the state in our 50 or 60 field offices and at headquarters. We have identified 110 power users, and these peer supports will receive additional training and be embedded with teams across the state to answer basic questions and, su and to support their coworkers when we go live uh, in January. We also have been working on our interfaces with our public, other public agencies and private businesses that we uh, interface with on a daily basis. We've identified the technical contacts for each stakeholder, and we're working with groups like Oregon State Police, LEDs, and others to make sure that their systems and our system will continue to communicate in the future. We also have testing uh, going on um, in the future. We are going to be contracting with a private contractor to do some external testing with our external customers like dealers, record account holders, and the general public to check to make sure our system is intuitive, useful, and usable as we intended it to be. Um, so we're looking forward to having public input on how the system uh, works in the future. Uh, that's coming up uh, this fall. Our go live date for the vehicle components of the system is January 22nd, 2019. And then that's just four months from now. And then 18 months later, we plan to go live with the driver's related functions. And that's in July of 2020. And that includes the real ID components of the system. We're doing a lot to help our employees prepare for the changes that are coming. We did a midpoint change readiness survey recently to understand uh, our staff and if they are ready, willing, and able to use the new system. Uh, it came out very well. We'll do one more change readiness survey right before we go live to make sure that we identify areas that need attention uh, before we go live. We also have launched a series of monthly call-in sessions for our DMV managers to have a real-time opportunity to ask questions about current topics and share significant insights about the vehicle's rollout. And these sessions provide managers with a supportive environment where they can uh, share tools and strategies with one another. Uh, we released our second issue of the public-facing newsletter, Shifting Gears. The goal of the external newsletter is to inform our customers of the program's progress and provide helpful information about how customers can conduct business with DMV after implementation. And that's my part. I'm going to turn the time over to Tom to talk about some other things that we've done over the last six months. Okay, great. In May of this year, um, we held an online open house. Are you, are you familiar with those? Okay. And uh, similar to what the uh, Public Transit had done with their report, just make that available to the public. Uh, it's the first time we've used that particular tool. And um, after considering what it might have been like with actually traveling around the state and finding space and cost of overnight lodging and everything else, we decided it was a much better approach to go with the online online open house and just to give it a give it a try. Um, it really increased the public participation level. It, we didn't quite have as many people as I might have hoped to to participate, but it still was was quite good. With the um, this format, it worked nicely because we could both share information about what we're about, what we're doing, and the types of changes that are coming. Uh, but we could also um, ask some questions. So embedding some surveys in, in that and getting some, some feedback as well uh, was also very, very, very valuable to us. Uh, they learned about our efforts, and we got some feedback about the, kind of the direction that we're, we're going. Some of the highlights. Um, we were able to get, gather feedback from 465 Oregonians from all across the state, and it actually had pretty good representation across the state. Uh, not only is this number higher than we would have expected if we'd done it in person, but uh, we saved on that travel and logistical costs. So our first uh, online open house, uh, we used the price agreement with a company called JLA. It's a public information and outreach firm out of Portland. It's a small, small business. Uh, I believe it's female-owned business, too. Um, 
it gave us a chance to kind of learn how that process works. I think next time we might be able to do more of it ourselves with more of a do-it-yourself approach. But in the first time through it, it was nice to have somebody else do some of the technical aspects of putting it together and, and making sure everything flowed you know, nicely. Uh, I want to go over a few of the results from the survey, uh, but first let me just tell you a little bit more about how we promoted the event and, and uh, it being available. In addition to posting a link to the online open house at the top of every DMV web page, we also conducted an earned media campaign and used the ODOT social media channels to get the word out. Two news release releases went out, one on the first day that it opened on May 1st and another about a week before it was scheduled to close. Although media in the Portland market did not pick up the story, unfortunately, many media outlets in other regions of the state helped us encourage the public to participate. In addition to online stories from the Grand Observer, KTVZ, KEZI, and Patch.com, we had an interview with KEX Radio and one television broadcast story from the NBC affiliate in Eugene, KMTR. Total estimated reach of this news coverage was approximately 56,000 impressions. After the initial outreach, we observed a drop-off in survey responses. Uh, so participation was encouraged through a boosted post on social media. By using this low-cost advertisement method on both Facebook and Inst Instagram, we were able to better inform the public of this opportunity to provide input. This $200 boost yielded approximately 40,000 people being reached and drove 576 clicks to the online open house website. The two posts also generated significant discussion and awareness among the public and the post showed a combined 467 reactions, comments, and shares from that. Overall, we were able to reach a total of more than 100,000 Oregonians and invite them to participate in the event, as well as inform them about our transformation program. Total cost to us, direct cost, was about $5,400. So here's uh, one of the questions that we asked respondents had to do with what level of support they would have for different services or features if we were to offer those in the future. We asked about online application forms, scheduling appointments, guided automated forms, payment plans, and online personal DMV accounts. There was very strong support for all of the proposed services that were listed on those questions. The area with the strongest show of support, which was about 80%, was for online application forms. This feature is planned to launch with the implementation of our Oliver system, of the SDP system. It provides an early opportunity for us to show the public that we're putting their feedback to work, and it's also an indicator that the online application forms as a result of our transformation work will be welcome news to people. After the initial outreach, we observed, whoops, I'm going the other direction. We also asked customer which scenario best describes how they view their time spent at DMV. For example, spend as little time as possible, even if it means waiting longer to receive what they need, versus maybe spending a little more time at DMV if it means that they get what they want faster. Customers valued the faster product over how long they spend in an office. When I talk about product, it's plates, it's stickers, it's titles, permits, driver's licenses. They want to walk out with what they want if they can and not have to come back for a, a repeat visit. We know that after our new system is implemented, some tra transactions may actually take a bit longer at the counter. Uh, this survey response indicates that our customers, at least 46% of them, will have the patience to deal with these changes as long as they get what they need. It shows us that most customers have a desire to leave with their business handled and the product in hand, even if it means they might wait a bit longer or have a longer transaction at the counter face-to-face -face with, our, with our employees. Uh, we did provide written materials for you as well, as far as our status, and we're here to answer any other questions that you might have. So I always want to know what's keeping you up at night. Are there certain pieces that um, I mean, the rollout seems to be going fairly well, mm -hmm. um, but what seems to be keeping you up at night, if anything? I know when Ben was asked that question six months ago, mm -hmm. uh, it was the, the network capacity in our field offices. And I, I can say we're, we're down to one office, I think, and it's just a few, a week or so away from it being upgraded, that one office. Okay. You get all 60 up to a kind of a basic minimum standard, has been taken care of. So I don't know how he's sleeping now. but Sleeping uh, a little better, yeah. A little better, okay. <laughs> what else do you have that 
Um, we, we are changing the way we do business to leverage the new system, and so we're moving a lot of the data entry up front. So in field offices, rather than send everything to headquarters and then try to get the work done, we're trying to get it done up front so we have the customer there, we have all the information we need and can be more successful, but it is a shift in how we do business, and we, um, our employees will take a while to get used to that shift. So mm -hmm. some of those business process changes may, be, may take a while for employees to get used to. And I think part of that is is recognizing that that will occur yeah. instead of mm -hmm. just assuming that everyone's going to buy in and right. jump. Yeah, right. Please, uh, Ben, Tom, thanks. Uh, good update on this, and uh, I've heard a lot of good things about JLA um, from other groups as well. Um, so glad you guys are working with them. But I was curious, how many other outside vendors will the? the well, actually, let me ask the first question: Is that the JLA? Um, relationship is directly through the department, correct? I think it's a, uh, Commissioner Simpson, I think it's a um, statewide contract that we tapped into, but ODOT definitely has used it, you know, work order contracts off of that, yeah. So then are there other outside vendors the department will need to leverage or reach out to throughout this process? I'm just curious about that. We're currently using three contractors. The, the primary, the main general contractor on this is Fast Enterprises, yep. and we've purchased a commercial off-the-shelf system, proprietary system, and uh, for the most part, almost entirely, they hire people to work for them. They rarely use subcontractors. Part of it is they protect their intellectual property very closely, <laughs> very cautiously around that. So uh, they basically hire a lot of their own people. Uh, the second contractor we're using is around the organizational change leadership work, the OCL work and that is CGI. And then the other contractor is our quality assurance, the, the risk assessment you know, company, which is CSG. Um, those are the three contracts that we're working with right now. And then as we need other things, like when we, before we even brought on FAST, we did a lot of data cleanup, kind of readiness work we knew we had to do before we brought the consultant on. We hired a company to do that work. Um, we'd done some other smaller things, but Really, it's those three roles. It's the it's the prime, the general contractor that we're working with. Fast, quality assurance, and organizational change leadership are the are the main things. And, and you said the CSG <coughs> is the quality assurance group. Right? Uh, yes, yes. We're required to do that on a large, you know, IT related project like this. And w what percentage would you say we're we, we're at right now, given this uh, this original scope? Are we of completion, thirty percent. You have a sense of that? I thought I saw. We have, we have two rollouts. The vehicles roll out in January, and the drivers roll out in July of 2020. So we're almost halfway uh, through the process. Got it. Please. I just want to say it's uh, as a frequent user of the DMV because I I uh, have made more than one car, so I go there to take care of them frequently. And my goal for the summer is to make sure everything's legal and everything's operational. But um, I, I just, I, again, I think you guys do a really good job. It's really nice to have one-stop shopping. And as someone who has uh, dealt over the course of my life with several other DMVs in other states, um, which I think it's a hard benchmark, but um, mm -hmm. I'll take Oregon DMV any day and I, I think the attitude, the fact that you can get a lot of things done uh, at one window and just, mm -hmm. and, and I, don't, I don't think I can think of a, a, a single incident where they weren't able to accommodate and they'll say, hey, we'll have that in the mail to you, you'll have it in a week or whatever it was. So mm -hmm. I think just, but I, I think um, the culture that is there, the service attitude I think is um, very good and uh, just keep doing what you're doing. I think if this, helps us be more efficient. And again, I, I think it, if you think about it for most people, it is their only um, engagement, direct engagement with government, mm -hmm. right? So it's the impression mm -hmm. they get. And so mm -hmm. um, I think it's, uh, it's good that it's positive and you can, and you can uh, solve a lot of problems at once. But anyway, I just wanted to pass that along. I know you get a lot yeah. of griping. Um, but no, uh, not not for me. I just know people. I think it's like weather, right? People just yeah. like to say stuff. I had to go to the DMV, you know. But for me, it's like, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah. Those guys are pretty good. Very personable. Great, great. Yes. Yeah, we have excellent employees. Yes, you do. They do, do a great job. 
this is a this is a cultural shift in terms of how we operate in general. And I think um, I also want to underscore Commissioner Simpson's comments. Where we can, we want to continue that commitment to Oregon contracts and mm -hmm. engaging individuals within our own communities to be able to provide this service. So um, I appreciate you bringing that forward, and I know that that's at the forefront of your minds as well. But mm -hmm. um, great work. Great. Seems like things are, you know, knocking on wood. We're moving well, along. I actually didn't answer your question about what keeps me up at night. If oh, you, yes, if you would thank like you. To yes, well, then it, yes, please, Tom. Um, go. It's the transition period. Ah. Okay. Um, it's similar to a construction project. Uh, you know, in, in fact, our next version of Shifting Gears, our public-facing newsletter, is going to have a whole page devoted to uh, don't mind our dust or something to that effect. <laughs> uh, because when you're under construction, when you are switching from old to new, we're, we're going to start with a backlog, actually, of transactions, vehicle transactions that we, ha we can't work on because we're getting ready for the new system. So we start day one with a backlog. And that's, that's going to be tough to yeah. eat away at that while doing the day-to-day -day work that comes in with the new system. So there's some real challenges, I think, for us in those first few weeks, few, first few months, potentially, as we work through and kind of stabilize things and get more efficient with, with the tools um, and business processes that we have. Mm -hmm. there, there may be some rough times there. I, and I'd be remiss not to point that out to you as well, right. that it's not a just snap your fingers and suddenly everything's wonderful. It's, it's going to take a little bit of time to transition. It's a, it's a very good tool, a very good company. Things are going to work much better, and we'll be able to offer some things we can't, obviously cannot do today. But there's going to be a little bit of a rough patch, I suspect, as we go through that, that January, February period, just to let you know that. Okay. And remind me again the real ID timeline. So we're not going to bump into creating ourselves our own perfect storm of, of push because of a media blitz on yeah. real ID and pardon our dust right um, and we create a nightmare that's my other nightmare oh okay it, it's actually <laughs> the federal real ID act in those those time okay. frames because we we really can't finish that compliance work until we do this second rollout with STP and that like you said it's actually July 6th is the date we've picked in 2020 and at that point we okay. can offer a compliant card which will have a, a black star in the upper right corner of those cards as a, as a distinguishing feature um, but we can't start issuing those until that all the happens. systems and everything are ready to go on July 6th TSA at airports will start requiring a compliant driver's license and ID card or a passport or something else, but it has to be a compliant driver's license October 1st of 2020. Do the math. It's a little mm -hmm. less than three months. Mm -hmm. So that's a very short window before they start telling people, we won't accept a standard Oregon driver's license. You'll have to have one that is compliant or a passport or a passport card or a, uh, some of the federal military documents, TWIC cards. Uh, there's a lot of different things people can get, but they're not qualified for them right. either. They're kind of specialized. So that's, that's going to be a big, difficult time for us. And that's why we also brought forward a budget request for Next Biennium, asking for some additional positions to help us through that period, because we know we're going to get more people walking in the door asking for that, a replacement card that is compliant versus what they have today. Well, if our outreach and communication plan works, we will be asking for that, and we need to be prepared to make sure that we can accept those individuals that we've just asked to come in. That's right. <laughs> so, okay. Well, yeah. lean on us and, and continue to keep us involved. Okay. Um, do we have public comment on, okay, wonderful. Yep. I wasn't able to, sorry, Lynn, I saw a message come in, but I wasn't able to, no worries. So, uh, gentlemen, maybe um, just stay put in case we have questions or, um, so please, yes. Nice to see you. Yes, please. And I know you know the protocol, just state your name yes. for the record. Great I'm to see you again, and the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Venki Ramakrishnan. I'm with a company called Sigma Consultant. Let's make sure that your microphone, um, that we have the benefit of getting it on the recording and hearing you better. Right. There, you there, there you go. All right. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Venki Ramakrishnan. I'm with a company called Sigma Consultants from Portland, Oregon. Um, I've been a few times here, testimony, public testimony that we are uh, executing this project just to give an observation um, in some other states recently in Maryland there was a similar modernization happen at the time they given 25 percent for a small business participation the company award has been awarded 
even though it's a proprietary software there are many ways other companies can participate in that also i believe fast won the contract they have subcontracted some of the work i mean is a participant i brought this information uh, more than a year ago like 18 months ago about the same state of maryland how other states able to do that so i mean or odot is very helpful to the community so that the tax dollars goes into the local community hiring the local oregonians for the project um, that's uh, i just so essentially you're saying that it's a choice by them to either hire or contract am i understanding that correctly even though it's a lot of proprietary software in the in us like sap oracle and this software in this in the state of maryland similar dma monetization the contract awarded to fast mm -hmm. in that contract agreement or in the proposal there is a requirement for a certain percentage like 20 or 25% of using the small business participation okay. they were able to utilize that option okay uh, i am sure that if they can do something whatever for the oregonian corporations to participate and do some value add and also help oregonians to get some opportunities and jobs okay thank you thank you do we so i think that goes um travis we had asked to kind of bookmark some of these conversations i think i'd like to bookmark this one and bring it back i know that we have had this conversation and we have kept it as a as a priority to make sure that we are contracting um because we even had a conversation yeah, earlier like should we contract ago, yes. with <laughs> that organization or with that company in general um but if there are opportunities we want to be able to weigh the pros and cons of um how that factors in and and how we do that and so um let's have a have a conversation about um what opportunities might still remain within this existing contract and um take that into consideration thank you chair please so are there checkpoints or like uh benchmarks in the current contract with fas I'm not sure and I and then I don't even know whether or not what we can or can't do legally and I'm looking to Bonnie back there but I'm just curious as to are there checkpoints in there for one and two I'd be curious uh sorry I having a hard time pronouncing Vinky Vinky so I'm curious as to whether or not if uh if the Maryland state was if they had implemented whatever their policy was around using smaller firms on the front end of the contract or did they do it at some point after the contract was already executed i think the contract has been awarded just few months ago and um, in that rfp language itself there was a mention clearly about utilizing the small business more than a year ago or 16 months ago i brought the same piece of paper i brought it to the commission and explained that situation so that um it's possible only thing is uh, as in a commission we have to take some extra steps to help the organizations to get to some opportunities and i know that tom you had had comments for us at that moment as well in terms of our particular contractor and i don't know if it's appropriate or um if you feel that now is the time to make those comments um i am sensitive to discussing a contract mid contract uh, i don't know if that um plays in but i do see bonnie kind of nodding a little bit so um i i can say that i understand that uh, maryland included it as a, a requirement in their rfp so okay. when they started their procurement i understand they included a provision around this piece so that all the vendors who received it who prepared proposals could price that into their their proposal as a piece because when you're contracting out sometimes you end up paying more Sure. Cuz there's another party involved in the in the process. So they they at least knew up front that that was the price, that was an expectation within scope of what was expected. When our RFP was issued uh, 3 years ago, uh it was not a requirement in our RFP. Okay. And it, it, it's not with nothing state law, there was nothing no directive for us at that time to include anything in the RFP. So when this was brought forward, we were ready almost to sign the contract. Mm -hmm. And so to go back we would have lost quite a bit of time with renegotiating the terms of that contract okay in advance of signing with the with the company so so, so i think it's just um, the, the yeah, facts no. of where we were this hit no that that, we that makes total along. sense and that's why i was asking that question mm -hmm. cuz it seems kind of awkward if you're under contract to 
you know, mm -hmm. try to revise the contract. But right. that's why I was just curious. It sounded like that's something they did on the front end. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Exactly. Um, Which brings me back to we want to offer opportunity wherever we can and mm -hmm. bake that into our RFPs to be able to afford those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that goes back to getting ahead of it versus behind it. And uh, so yeah. I, we do I have this on our I, work plan as a discussion and um, so that we can look from a system approach of what we're trying to achieve in terms of goals. And I think for this particular contract, I want to be sensitive to having too much dialogue about the particulars of it. But I would look to you, Tom, if there are opportunities that you see where they could maybe be contracting or if there is a mm -hmm. point that seems distinct enough for us to enter this into um, a discussion going forward. Or, or as I had mentioned uh -huh. earlier, and that's why I was asking, uh, it because it sounded like the agency was able to contract with JLA directly. So if there are benchmarks or things in which yeah. the department needs support or assistance or outreach efforts with that we take those type of thought processes into Yeah, it doesn't have to be with that particular contract. Really yeah, any part of this exactly. system transformation mm -hmm. that yeah. we're doing, mm -hmm. we want to be able to weigh that and be able to offer those opportunities. Sure. Sure. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I appreciate you. it. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Was that okay? Wonderful. All right. So next, we have a, a discussion that will help inform us going forward around facility planning and mobility targets related to the Oregon Highway Plan. Mr. Rock, Mr. Havid, good to see you. And then, just for those that are on deck, I believe that we are going to have a. You know, um, safety uh, funding discussion uh, with Mac and I'm just teeing up the team here um, before we get into the discussion about redistribution. So I'm going to just put a little piece in there. So please, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Bainey. Uh, members of the Commission, again, for the record, Eric Hovig, Planning Section Manager for ODOT and co-presenting with me. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Rock. I'm the Transportation Planning Unit Manager for the Transportation Development Division. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about facility planning in general with an emphasis around alternate mobility and specifically around alternate highway mobility. Uh, and the real reason for this is probably starting next week you should ex or next month you should expect to see a couple of facility plans or other actions coming forward where we're going to be asking you to adopt some alter alternative mobility targets for various sections of Oregon highways. Uh, since we haven't had a few of those for a while, we thought this was a great opportunity just to make sure everybody's on the same page around what those actions are. So we'll talk just a little bit about the planning context and facility planning uh, specifically, but really we want to focus on the highway mobility policy. What does that include and what do we need to go through and what does it mean when the Commission actually adopts an alternative mobility target for a specific highway segment? So uh, you've probably seen this uh, diagram before a few times. Uh, this really lays out the connection between planning, uh, the different levels of planning down into programming. So at the top, we have the mode and topic plans. Uh, and I think earlier this morning, you approved the Oregon Public Transportation Plan. That is one of our mode and topic plans, very similar to the Oregon Transportation Plan, Highway Plan, Bike Ped. There's a whole laundry list. Those plans are very high level policy-focused vision, set up a framework for investment strategies and priorities, but they don't get into specifics around projects and the actual kind of investments that need to be made at a project level. That happens down in the next box where we talk about state facility plans, MPO plans, transportation system plans. This is where we work with local governments to develop those transportation system plans that identify for the next 20 years what kind of investments and priority investments do we need to make. A facility plan is a specific type of planning activity that happens during this stage in the process. And facility planning, what we really want to do when we enter into a facility plan is there's usually a need to go to a higher level of detail than we get into at a high level transportation system plan. A TSP, a system plan for a city or county, really only looks about the general need, mode, function, and location of improvements. But sometimes we need a little bit more detail to understand what those improvements might need to get to. So the three real reasons we do a facility plan is to provide that finer level of detail. 
Where do we need to understand what the impacts to right away are going to be? How are they going to impact community values? How are they going to impact travel for different modes or different uh, uh, systems? How does freight uh, potentially get impacted? So we need to go to a little le a finer level of detail in those plans. Another reason we do a facility plan is we may have an upcoming investment. Um, and in fact, on the opening slide in the corner, you see a picture of a diverging diamond. Uh, that was an interchange down in the Phoenix area where we needed to have a more robust level of planning to deal with that planned investment. So how are we going to be able to construct that? What are the issues and then uh, the considerations we need to be thinking of early on before we move right into project delivery? So that's where we want to plan for those investments before breaking ground or before you approve a project that goes in the STIP that hasn't had that complete thought. We haven't worked with our local government partners to get the land use and other issues resolved. And then the last bullet up here is how do we align performance objectives? And this is really where it links to alternative mobility and alternative mobility targets. Um, we talked earlier when the legislative leadership was in front of us talking about congestion and the fact that our roadways are becoming more and more congested. We have mobility targets that you've established in the highway plan, but we're not able to meet those in a lot of places. Doing a facility plan, we can set those expectations with our local government partners to make sure that we're on the same page of how we're going to manage, operate, and eventually build and construct our system out into the future. So aligning those performance objectives is really a critical element of doing the facility planning process. Uh, this is just a list of the types of facility plans that may come across uh, from time to time. The vast majority of the ones that we really do are around interchanges. Uh, those usually need a lot of extra look, uh, a lot of complexity, a lot of issues around freight, freight mobility, economics, land use, uh, certain corridors we need to look at and refinements. But we also get into access management, scenic byways, and other kinds of facility plans. And just for kind of reference, this is not something new <laughs> that we've been doing as part of ODOT. We have brought a lot of facility plans throughout the years to you for adoption. Some of these include alternative mobility targets, some of them don't. It really depends on what the issues are that we need to address. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael, who's really going to focus in on the alternative mobility targets and process. Okay, thanks, Eric. So, yeah, I'm going to spend just a few slides digging into some more detail about what this thing is called alternative mobility targets and the Oregon Highway Plan policy itself. So. This is something that you may see come up in facility plans, but not every facility plan will have a, a resetting of performance expectations, but many will. Uh, so we wanted you to get a little more background before the, the next batch comes through. But it's also, um, it doesn't have to be a facility plan where we run into these issues. Oftentimes, they come up through working with local communities, a city, a county, or regional transportation plan. Uh, where we're realizing sort of with an overall system look that performance expectations are going to be a challenge in the future. So they can really take either of those avenues, facility plan directly or the local plan itself, the transportation system plan. And I think you'll see both kinds um, on, the, on the table before too long. Uh, so these, first of all, the highway mobility policy itself is something that was founded back in the 1999 Oregon Highway Plan. So it is one of the foundational elements of our last uh, large update to the Oregon Highway Plan. But we did some clarif clarification in 2011. And actually, former Commissioner Lohman was here earlier. I recalled as uh, you were hearing the list of projects that he had worked on, he was actually one of our liaisons to that process from the Commission. So the Department and the Commission worked on some revisions to the Highway Plan to make this alternative mobility process um, make sense in today's conditions. So we did quite a bit of work, and some of it was based on legislative interest uh, and connections to the transportation planning rule at that time. Uh, the way that the uh, mobility targets are established in the highway plan is uh, a measure called volume to capacity ratio, so VC ratio for short, basically the amount of traffic uh, that's on a facility versus the capacity uh, that, that, that it allows. And you can measure it in today's conditions or for planning purposes, we're usually looking out into the future, saying where are we seeing a need for uh, a fix or uh, an issue uh, arising in the future. And then the alternative mobility process allows us to reset those based on current conditions or what we're expecting in the future. And that's what we're here to talk a little bit more about today. So some of the reasons why you might need to establish an alternative mobility target is probably not going to be news for uh, the commission. It's challenges that you, you run into and we face as an agency all the time. Certainly 
financial constraints, um, we are not able to build uh, investments to address congestion issues uh, a lot of cases. And, and as Oregon grows, you know, and uh, that will happen more and more in the future. So that's certainly reason one and one very clear one. Even though some cases we may have the ability and the resources to make those investments, we have other constraints in the area. They could be environmental or the way their communities have um, grown around the transportation system. We know that there's constraints to the kind of investment that it would take to meet what the mobility targets are now or in the future. So that's a constraint. Um, but we do plans uh, and we do have um, transportation objectives in a lot of different areas. And a lot of what this does is allow us to balance local mobility needs other objectives for other modes and say, is a highway investment uh, one route to take or how do we make those trade-offs um, from a local mobility standpoint that make the most sense for that area moving forward? So certainly all of those can factor into the equation. A quick question, yes. going back to the 2011-2012 timeframe, was that TPR change, was that the from a standard to a target? And that's where we tried to allow for a little bit more flexibility, Correct. acknowledging some of those challenges, especially the financial constraints. Yes, and, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Yep, we made the change from thinking of this as a very uh, more rigid finance standard to a target that we're uh, trying to shoot for, but understanding that there's a lot that goes into that equation. So that was part of the changes. There were companion changes in the transportation planning rule that happened at the same time to increase that flexibility as well. So uh, try not to uh, worry too much about the numbers uh, of this table. This is actually an, an excerpt out of the highway plan. Uh, and there's a lot more that goes uh, into this uh, additional rows, additional columns, if you look in the highway plan itself. But we did want to share this for an example of what these uh, mobility targets look like uh, in, in the highway plan itself. So you can see on the left side, we've got basically categories and different types of state highway facilities, interstate statewide facilities, expressways, and it goes on. Uh, and, and across the top, uh, you'll see different either geographic areas like an MPO, unincorporated communities, rural lands, or this type of the uh, operating uh, conditions for that part of the system. And you can see that the numbers are different. The mobility or congestion expectations are different. They're higher, uh, you know, within urban areas and perhaps high-speed rural facilities. And so there's a, um, a baseline understanding that, you know, every – uh, facilities look different as it is, uh, but that gives us a, a starting point for um, this mobility target discussion. This is another excerpt out of the highway plan. It's actually an example of what a alternative mobility target can look like. This one was established at the same time as we did the highway plan, recognizing that the Portland metro area has different challenges, certainly as a major metropolitan area. Uh, and, and so they have different standards established already in the highway plan. What I wanted to point out here, and again, this is just a sample, there's many more uh, uh, rows uh, in, in the highway plan for this, but you'll notice the numbers are significantly higher. Things are anticipated to operate at congested levels. But you can also notice that we're looking beyond just a peak um, one hour time frame, we're looking at, well, recognizing that things are going to last longer in a congested condition. So some, one of the options for resetting performance expectations is looking more broadly through the peak period, um, multiple hours of the day, and realizing that's probably what we need to be planning for. Other areas may go through an alternative mobility target process, and we realize seasonal conditions are the main challenge, like in our coastal communities. Or we might want to try a measure that's different altogether than BC. But what's important is we still need to apply it the same way in the planning arena. So it's got to work um, for all the different uses of, of our mobility targets. So last thing I want to point out is the highway plan establishes a process for how, how we need to work with local communities to develop an alternative mobility target. Um, it's important that the, you know, these are resetting performance expectations long term. It's important that we take a system look or a facility plan look to do this. Uh, we want to work in close coordination with our partners uh, and make sure everybody's on the same page with this reset of expectations. And the reason we wanted to call this to your attention today is it requires a highway plan change. It's changing uh, our policy document and that's something that the commission has a role in and why you'll uh, be seeing these come through through facility plans or other system planning work that we've been engaged with in, in local communities. With that, I'll turn it back to Eric. And 
the last point from Michael really leads into this slide. Uh, when you take an action to approve an, an alternate mobility target or approve a facility plan, it is amending the Oregon Highway Plan or one of our other uh, long-range transportation plans. That now constitutes a land use action, so we need to make sure we're following state land use laws and procedures and requirements. There's three elements we have to meet within that. First is around compatibility. We need to make sure we're compatible with what is called for in our own long-range plans, but also within city and county. These need to be compatible with each other. They need to be uh, consistent as well. Um, we need to be in compliance with our statewide planning goals. So this is why we work very closely with our Department of Justice and Bonnie in crafting up the findings of compliance to make sure that the action you're taking is consistent with those statewide planning goals uh, in approving and adopting an alternative mobility target or even a facility plan. And then finally, again, back to that consistency because we have the state agency coordination program, the transportation planning rule. This requires that state, regional, local plans all be consistent with each other. It wouldn't do any good for the commission to set a mobility expectation or a facility plan for an ODOT facility and then for our local government partners to have a totally different set of expectations. Um, that's just going to make for a lot of difficulty for us to move forward in our management practices, but also in our STIP and construction practices moving forward. That's why it's real important for having us uh, really do these three C's uh, through the process. So that's really kind of setting the framework for what um, alternate mobility through either a transportation system plan or through a facility planning kind of process will be. And again, we expect a few more of these to come down through our regional planning programs. I think there's at least two planned for October. So uh, hopefully this will not come as a shock when you see them on your desk and in your uh, packet for the next meeting. But we'll entertain any questions or comments you may have. Mine's more, as I look at this, that is a lot of investment of time and uh, process. I know that we have um, Senate Bill 100 and a lot of you know, land use laws that other states do not. But if we were to create this today, would it look like this? Or would we maybe, I just wonder as we, you know, we're, we're envisioning the 2.0 for transportation in Oregon. And we are strengthening and, um, you know, really elevating that partnership with DLCD and LCDC. And I just wonder, is this the best way for us to go forward <laughs> with this type of activity? Chair Bainey, um, I'm not sure I've ever been asked to uh, wipe the slate clean before <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and how I would, you know, approach it. Um, I think there's always opportunities to find efficiencies in process. Um, but we really do have a very solid foundation within our administrative rules and our statutes about how transportation planning is supposed to be informed. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the bedrock of that is that we have um, involvement from stakeholders and a lot of other parties that have a stake in the outcome of these decisions. Mm -hmm. And again, as a state that allows a lot of public involvement and input, that strengthens the outcome, but it also takes time and adds to process. Sure. Um, it can be a little bit... Um, uh, confusing to folks. It can definitely be frustrating mm -hmm. <laughs> once in a while, um, but that's why we want to have these alignments. Uh, we've had projects where we were not in alignment with our local government partners, and uh, we've had STIP projects have to suffer or be delayed because we have not done the work necessary. So while there's probably efficiencies that can be gained, the good part is still going through this process helps lock us in and get those expectations aligned. And Chair Brady, yes, if I could yes. add a little bit to that. I, I think most of the time we're, for the, at least the alternative mobility targets themselves, we're going to be piggybacking on other work, other planning work that's needed in the area. So um, you didn't notice on the list any specific plan called an alternative mobility plan. Mm -hmm. But instead of while the communities are planning for what they what their transportation system will look like long term or what a facility will look like for us long term, it's just a question that we need to uh, now's the time now's the time to get a handle on it and it's part of that process more than um, a lot of new work we hope mm -hmm. so which is great that's the outcome of 2017 and the right. increase in the gas tax and gets back to that communication and the public needs to see that investment they're being asked to pay more and we need to show um, that you know this investment's going forward too i don't have an example where it's caused an issue but i just thought i'd ask that question so wonderful any other comments okay Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Peets, Ms. Miller, we have an inf a discussion around transportation option activities.
Let me just say for my colleagues, the hope at this discussion is, are there other things that we need to be thinking about? Is there, um, is this hitting the mark? Are there things that uh, you know of that we need to be looking into? Um, this is kind of the beginning of a journey. <laughs> so um, let's, you know, really be engaged on this one, so. Great, well I hope to provide an overview of where we are and some of the things that we're working on or considering in the future and then engage in that dialogue with you. So for the record, my name is Amanda Peets. I'm the ODOT Program Implementation and Analysis Manager. And I think, uh, as you saw in the agenda item before you, um, in the conversations with legislators earlier this afternoon, congestion is a significant issue that Oregon faces. And I think both the commission and the agency are challenged with this really tough question about how do we find innovative approaches for addressing this problem. And I would offer that transportation options are some of the most cost-effective strategies that you can look to that help spread demand across our entire transportation system and accomplish more. So transportation Amanda, options. Amanda, uh, real quick. The yes, only please. picture I missed on the top was a scooter. So whenever we can <laughs> squeeze that one in some there. <laughs> All right, we'll do that for you, Commissioner Simpson. Uh, so transportation options programs connect people to transportation choices, allowing them to bike, walk, take transit, drive, share rides, and telecommutes. That's the definition in our statewide transportation options plan, and use a scooter too. Um, so while transportation options are about these modes, they're not about making specific investments within the modes for infrastructure. So it's not about adding bike lanes, for example, it's not about adding public transportation service. Rather, it's about making those modes more viable and available for people's use. So in that vein, it's the strategies, programs, and investments to do that. An example would be, so for um, promoting people to bike, it might be safety education for our children on knowing how to bike safely um, and understanding the rules of the road. For public transportation, um, it might be providing information on routes, times of routes for buses, um, how to ride the bus, or even working with employers on transit passes. Um, so I think of transportation options as rethinking our capacity. And uh, this is a pretty famous graphic, I'm sure many of you have seen before, that really shows from a roadway capacity standpoint um, how much space is taken up when everybody walks, um, that compared to when they take public transportation, when they bike, or when they drive themselves. I would challenge us, however, to think about um, this in a different way, and we think about instead of roadway capacity, people movement capacity. Because transportation options are about providing, um, that is about taking advantage of the existing capacity that we have today and really trying to maximize the efficient movement of people and providing them the choices that best meet their needs. And so as we talk about transportation options being a people movement capacity, um, type of strategy, it's not surprising that another pseudonym for transportation options is transportation demand management. Um, in 2015, when the commission adopted the uh, Oregon Transportation Options Plan, we were very deliberate in calling it transportation options as opposed to transportation demand management. And that's partially because it's much more than just managing demand on our system. I think core to some of the goals that you see up here, and there's 10 total in the transportation options plan, is accessibility, for example, and making sure that we're able to get people to those critical services that they need. And if we do that, then we're affecting the economy because we're getting people to jobs, we're getting people to shopping. We're also affecting equity because we're helping all people get to where they need to go. So I'll focus probably the majority of the presentation on that mobility objective, in particular strategies um, that might be effective at uh, lessening traffic congestion. Um, I'll group these into what they help to accomplish and overview several of them. So um, I'll start with reducing drive alone trips. Um, ODOT has a role in park and ride facility as do other transportation agencies across the state. So we have several park and ride facilities along our interstates or state highways um, along those commuting corridors. And they provide a location for people to park and then reach their destination uh, potentially by bike, um, by public transportation service, uh, by carpooling or by van pooling. 
Um, we have a role in either providing those park and ride locations, but we also keep a statewide inventory of the park and ride facilities so that we can have a map uh, that people can access and understand where those locations are. And in the future, we might consider our transportation options program looking at needs. Where do we have gaps where we don't have a facility that people can park um, and maximize their multimodal experience? Uh, so I mentioned Vanpool a minute ago, and just to focus on that one, um, Vanpool is about helping to um, connect rides between major commuting corridors. So Portland to Salem, there's a number of vans that um, run along that corridor. Van pools are federally subsidized and include user fees. So in that way, they're both um, very cost effective and attractive for public transportation agencies to help sponsor. Um, however, not all public transportation agencies maybe realize that benefit. So one of the roles ODOT plays is working with those agencies on what is the value of some of these programs, um, where do we have areas where this could be really valuable and helpful, and then we provide some minimal um, fiscal and uh, administrative support as they're doing these. Um, probably the most recognizable transportation option strategy is high occupancy vehicle lanes or HOV lanes. Um, although Oregon doesn't have very many, we have one in the state around the Portland area up to the Washington border. Um, and these lanes allow vehicles with more than one occupant. Um, sometimes they're set with, uh, you have to have three or more or four or more. Um, they can be set on any condition uh, that allow people to have experience more free flow conditions. Um, the challenge, I think, in, in looking at this in other locations is you have to, have to have adequate space requirements. And so there's not necessarily a lot of locations in the state currently that have multiple lanes that one can be converted. Um, and often it's probably most popular to look at HOV lanes when you're adding new capacity in that new lane than would be a high occupancy vehicle lane. Um, an alternative to an HOV lane or a spinoff is a hot lane or a high occupancy toll lane, and I'm sure you're familiar with those in some of your recent tolling conversations. Um, lastly, for driver loan trips, I want to hit on um, ride matching software, and this is making people aware of their opportunities to share rides. ODOT has for years sponsored a ride matching software known as Driveless Connect. And that service allows people to match their origin and destination and share rides. The reason that ODOT plays a role in that is because it's cost effective. Instead of having each individual business or um, each individual transportation option provider pick a different service and pay for that, um, centralizing that is a lot of cost savings. But also, it drives everyone in the state then to a central tool and then increases the pool of people that can find their matches to their rides. We're currently looking at updating the system that's underlying Drive Less Connect um, to one that is more user-friendly, um, dynamic. And what we mean by dynamic is it's not just about your commute to and from work and finding a match for that, but also to and from a meeting, um, which is a lot of the trips that are on the system. Um, that is customizable so that businesses or others can use it uh, for their purposes and agile to changing technology. Uh, many explorer employers have expressed interest um, in the service. So as an example, ODOT or Nike um, can use a tool like this uh, to customize it to their employees so that um, you can share rides to meetings, to conferences, and to other similar events. We anticipate a new system like this uh, coming online in mid-2019. Great. Do we have someone that works with large employers and communities and kind of helps unlock the box of how you go about doing this? Uh, sure, so we, um, ODOT itself works with many employers in the state on transportation options, as well as our local transportation options providers. So there's many that we provide funding to across the state uh, that work with employers directly. Um, some employers that are large have their own transportation options staff, and then it's easier to work with those organizations. Um, other areas create transportation management associations. So there's a Lloyd District Management Association in Portland and some others, and those really are the business conglomeration that work through some of these issues and opportunities. Um, so shifting now to reducing peak hour trips, um, part of that can be um, moving away from single occupancy vehicle trips, but also changing the time of day that people commute, and that can be done either by um, the hours that people work or um, people working from home or remote workstation, um, and those, the latter really can take trips totally off the system. 
Um, and so to Cherbany's point, um, this is where it's really important to have these employer programs that are working directly with those entities that understand their needs, understand their employee base, um, and are able to um, work with them. And when they do that, um, they're often able, the employers are often able to um, shift the hours that people work, um, to allow their staff to telecommute, um, and we've seen some pretty significant benefits of this, or to provide incentives like working um, with TriMet, which is what's shown in this picture on transit passes, so it would be um, cheaper passes for their employees, so it provides an incentive for that other mode. Um, and I, I would say, in addition to your question, Chair Meany, um, employers and businesses are really see the benefit in transportation options, so much so that some of our, uh, many of the funding that our local transportation options providers get comes from contributions by businesses. So in your area, commute options for their transportation options budget, over half of that comes from contributions from businesses, foundations, and others that really see the value in this work. The um, hospital was looking at the need to add parking for staff. Mm -hmm. It was easier for them to add capacity into the existing transit system to be able to actually help get their staff around versus um, needing to pay for parking. And so they're going to still have to build some parking infrastructure, but not at the level that they would have needed to. So right. I think certainly there's a benefit there too. Right, which is likely also a cost savings. Too oh gosh, that. yeah, that was significant. Um, so also for reduce our peak hour trips, we don't only have just programmatic investments that we can make in transportation options. We can apply project specific um, enhancements. And so this photograph is of Interstate 5, um, Exit 97. We love when we call this project Exit 97. Uh, it's down in the Medford area in Southern Oregon. And in the morning peak hours around 8 a.m., traffic can back up all the way onto the freeway. So you can see kind of in the far distance of that photo, traffic queued all the way down there. Um, and so this is a really exciting project, I think, because I'm a geek and I used to be the planning manager. And so it's a direct application of the Oregon Highway Plan. And the Oregon Highway Plan, Policy 1G1, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, uh, says that we should be looking for efficiencies in the system before we add capacity. And this is a direct application of that. We're really looking at ways that we can, by transportation options, make this system more efficient. So as part of this project, what we're doing is we're working with employees and employers and the local transit authority to look for opportunities that we can shift people off those peak hours, um, have some telecommute, or take public transportation. Um, this slide shows the website that was just launched this week for that effort um, that really helps connect those employees and employers to those transportation options, um, provides discounted public transportation passes and other things. Um, so transportation options um, in many ways for congestion uh, can d uh, work to address um, long-term congestion, but also intermittent congestion, like from a construction event. The photograph shown here it was taken about a month ago in Eugene, downtown, where there um, is a big construction project in the area on our highway system that um, will have significant effects. And so you can see the bottom part of that banner is really trying to get people to know before they go. And it says, adjust your route, your time, or try a new way of getting there. And we find some of this outreach really does help shift that impact to congestion of that construction event. Another random question. Will we be doing an after project look at region one, which really was the poster child for using media and campaigns to be able to keep people, to have them know before they go so that we didn't end up with significant issues. Well, um, I just wonder if there is a way that we glean what worked and what didn't work because I haven't, quite frankly, it seems like it's worked fairly well, um, but it'd be great to know were there certain things that really did navigate that. Madam Chair, I don't know that we formally scheduled that. I know we do know some things that worked well and some things that didn't work well, such as equipment falling off of yes. trucks is not a good That's idea a in the middle thing. of a construction mm -hmm. zone. 
but certainly that's something we can broach with uh, Mr. Winsheimer and uh, make sure they do that. As they have a number of big projects coming up every year, this year may look tame oh. <laughs> in comparison to some future years. Sure. I just wonder, I mean, it, it makes me think about what they're doing here, and certainly that's been able to pay um, some positive div dividends in Region 1, too. Sure. So um, I defer to Mr. Brower on the um, Portland-specific example. I would say, however, across our transportation options programs, as we implement those, we often do either before or a and after studies. Um, and then also look at what is effective information for getting things out, whether it's TV spots, radio ads, banners like this. Um, and then we've adjusted our programs accordingly. So, for example, with transportation options, we find that um, some of the more expensive radio or TV ads isn't actually reaching a lot of people. So we've moved to some of the cheaper options, which is even more effective. So we're adjusting the program that way. And so we also try to look out on the horizon. So many of the project examples that I've shared with you are current things that we're engaged in or things that we've recently completed. Um, so as we scan the horizon um, and look for construction examples, in 2020 there's um, going to be some construction work on the Interstate 5 bridge between Oregon and Washington uh, where there will be a lane closure. And while you think 2020, while wow, it's a long ways out, we're having conversations right now with uh, Mr. Winsheimer and the Region 1 team and our transportation options folks about how do we solve this issue. We know it's going to have a significant impact on uh, travel during that time. So we're already in talks with our local transportation options providers about increasing carpooling and van pooling in the area and some innovative solutions potentially like bus on shoulder. And bus on shoulder is where it's allowing the bus to be in a more free flow condition and therefore might incentivize some people to have a more reliable trip by taking public transportation. We learned a fair amount about the bus on shoulder when we were in California at the tri-state meeting. And um, they're using it as just a, a way of getting more capacity out of their system too. And especially around those more congested time periods, I would love to see us do some of that. I know we don't have quite the same setup as they do in terms of the, um, the um, you know, enough room, I guess. Um, but I, I love this idea. Yeah, thank you. Um, so moving a, away a little bit from just that focus on transportation options for congestion, there are many other benefits um, that you can get from these investments. Um, so one I talked about earlier is um, connecting people to critical services. This is really core and foundational to what transportation options programs do. What's shown on the slide here is a veterans program um, that's led by our investments in uh, Rogue Valley Transit District's uh, funds for this program. Um, what I'd like to show you here, and I didn't put it on the slide, but it's a little handout that's given to all veterans in the area that participate in this program. And what it's able to show is it focuses on the services for veterans and their points of interest. So, for example, there's a Veterans in Recovery Center listed right here. And then it shows all the public transportation routes to get there, the biking and walking routes to access those services. So it really does um, kind of tailor to those needs, and I think that's the power and some of those local transportation options as it's catering to those needs. And if I might, I want to share a testimonial from one of the participants of this program who said, the GoVets program has enabled me to get out of my home and help me greatly with my depression. Thank you. This program has changed my world. And these are the kind of testimonials we see with some of these programs and just the value that you can't necessarily quantify. Um, another program that I think is really great to highlight um, in terms of connecting people to critical services is an innovation grant that we provided to Go Lloyd to look at nighttime worker access. And this is something in lead up to the Keep Oregon Moving Act in 2017 that a lot of legislature, legislators, um, ODOT and others heard is that access for people that work at night or low income folks um, can be really challenging and a barrier to work and we confirmed that with this study. So we gave an innovation grant to Go and Lloyd um, that looked at in particular low wage service and cleaning staff uh, who were working night shifts in the Lloyd District of Portland. Um, what they found in that study was that transportation is a major barrier to getting out there and that people were coming in as far as away as Woodburn and then trying to get back and forth at night. So as a result of this project, we provide information on materials, but also set up van pools and car pools to facilitate reliable access to this location and really connect people to jobs. Um, so separate from this particular example, our innovation grants are something that we run out of our transportation options program to really help 
uh, propel our plan implementation work, but also to um, be agile to changing technology and look for opportunities there, and to um, address specific needs and try to roll that out across the state. Uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, transportation options programs also can provide safety education for utilizing different modes. Um, in many ways, Safe Routes to School is a subset of transportation options that's about providing education and outreach to children so they can safely get to school. Um, so we have looked with our transportation options program, and I talked to you about in August of last year as we talked about uh, the statewide transportation improvement program, is that opportunity to leverage. And we're really implementing that right now is looking for opportunities to leverage the funding that we got from the Oregon Legislature for Safe Routes to School investments. And those are for infrastructure. And, and then pairing with that with transportation options dollars to provide the education and outreach to schools, to do some training to schools, as well as to work with the school districts or roadway authorities on identifying some of their needs and helping to put together some applications. Also in the vein of leveraging funds, um, we're looking at how we support investments in public transportation, particularly from the new funding we got for STIF. Um, and so the, the public transportation investments increase service, add capacity to the system, new routes, new times, new services, and transportation options pairs with that to let people know about those services and advertise them. Um, it does that by working with target audiences, knowing how to translate and get that right communication and messaging out there to facilitate institutional partnerships and to identify cross-jurisdictional opportunities for better connectivity. Um, and so at the core of it, it's really trying to uh, make the investments as effective as possible by pairing that uh, infrastructure investment with knowledge of that. And I've, I've heard criticism in the past. Why do you need to tell people about these routes? They can just figure it out or they should know. And the best parallel that I've ever heard to that argument is imagine that the Ford Motor Company created a new car, a new model, but they never advertised it. Would they expect to have many sales? And the answer is probably not. So the same is true with our infrastructure investments. If we're putting our dollars towards public transportation, we want to see those be effective. We need to let people know what those services are, and this is a program that can help to do that. Um, so before we get to questions and the discussion period, um, I did want to highlight that the individual in this slide, Stephanie Millar, um, she's shy and modest, but she's sitting here in the audience. I'm going to pull her up next time, and she's going to present. But she has been instrumental in leading this program um, and really making it what it is today. So I really want to acknowledge uh, her contribution. So she's over here. There you are. So with that, uh, happy to engage in any other questions you might have or a discussion of, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on some innovative things we can consider. Great presentation, <clears throat> really interesting stuff. I, um, I just really had one question, it's around the kind of the first part of your presentation and transportation options. Um, so I think choice is a huge part of the solution here and making people aware of the choices, which is kind of the latter part of your presentation, mm -hmm. both very key. Um, once you've established these options, and I know they're different in different communities and um, a lot of this is focused on the urban area, but the Portland metro area and maybe even the Portland core area to some degree, but the, the, the question is, once you have the options and you've made people aware of them, it seems to me that another piece of this is trying to encourage in an effective, not heavy-handed, but also not light-handed way that, that um, each one of us has a responsibility to know about our options and to make responsible choices. I mean, it, it really comes down to tens of hundreds of thousands of choices every day mm -hmm. that people know their options and they think, for today, given what I have to do today, my best option in terms of what I need to get done and the best social option, the best option for the whole system is for me to do X 
rather than why. And the next day, it may be different. And with some people, it may be the same every day. But you're not trying to get 100% of the people to um, maybe change how they, the choice they make. But I think you're trying to get a percentage of people to be aware of their options when they have choices and they make sense. You know, that's our responsibility is to make investments that allow them to have choices that make sense to say, you know, today I'm going here, I'm going to be here all day. Option A will take 25 minutes. Option B will take 30 minutes. Option B, though, will get me off the road. That might be the best option, considering what I have to get done and also it's the most responsible choice. So that, to me, is a huge communication initiative. Because sure. you've got, it's not so much about doing the infrastructure as it is about educating people to choice and encouraging them to make responsible choices. And that's how you keep the quality of life. Because if you, you, you build all these options, you make them all available, and everyone still goes out and gets in their car every day and makes every trip, no matter what their options are, um, in a single occupancy vehicle, and you had a million people, <laughs> I, I just, you can't get ahead of it. Uh, so that education is, I'm not sure how to do it, I just know it's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not a communications expert, but um, my wife, for example, is, and that's what she does every day. and. Um, so I just think that's got to be a part of our discussion here. How, what kind of a dialogue we have with the public, what kinds of public information we put out to enable people to understand choice. And it, it, be, it'll be different for every neighborhood, every part of the community. But so what do you, I'm getting the question now. What do you, what, what do you think about that? And what do you, I mean, what, what work are you doing in that area, I guess, is the question. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not possible for anyone to repeat that question. <laughs> uh, no, Commissioner Van Brocklin, I think it's an excellent question, and probably I was remiss in... Could you please repeat? No. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in not highlighting some of the aspects of transportation options. So I think ODOT's been pretty careful in our role is not about forcing uh, people no. to use certain modes. But I think to your point, it's providing that information. And it's not just the traveler information like the route schedule. It's also, hey, it's easier than you think. And um, hey, there's an impact when you get in your car and drive by yourself, whether to the environment or otherwise. And, and understanding the impacts, the benefits, the opportunities of those choices is absolutely core to what we do with transportation options. I think probably as an agency, we rely more on our local transportation options providers to know how to message within their communities um, what will resonate there because it, while it is, um, in this presentation at least, a very urban focus, transportation options are also you know, as far reaching in our eastern part of the state too, where it's critical that people don't have any other opportunity and they may not have the money to afford a car to be able to have that option. And, and knowing how to message to those people is gonna be different than knowing how to message to somebody else. So we tend to rely more there, uh, but there might be some future opportunities. We think about that as a statewide level as well. But this is a component of what you're thinking about, and right. this is a component of what we're trying to do. Correct. Because if your answer is no, then we need to talk more because I think we'll be we're, we're going to miss a big piece. Right. Yes. Yeah. So my answer is yes. I think I was remiss in not hitting that point in the discussion. <coughs> but that's absolutely part of transportation options. And when we provide traveler information, it's understanding those impacts. And, and I want to say I really take your point about forcing. This is not about forcing. This is about educating, giving people choices. It's up to the individual. I mean, that's the way it will be. Mm -hmm. And the individual ought to have the freedom to make those choices, and I believe that. Mm -hmm. But I just believe if we're going to solve these problems, we're going to have to have people, some people, to some degree, do some things differently. Okay. Well, and we need to rethink about how we approach the day as well. And it's a cultural shift, and we've made other cultural shifts within our lifetime. I mean, we all wear a seatbelt, hopefully. Um, you know, look at what we've done with tobacco usage. Look at what we've done. I mean, you used to be able to smoke on an airplane. I mean, that's there just are a variety of things that we have said, hey, this may not be the best way right. to go about doing it. But that was not without that type of 
incentivizing. Sure, there's public policy there as well. I'm certainly not suggesting that this is a public policy type of discussion. No. But communicating those options, incentivizing that type, but also showing what it can look like and taking away, dispelling some of the barriers of, um, you know, how do I use this system in the best way? I don't think the general public is going to say, I'd love to learn more. We need to help them know that they they need to learn more because there are a lot of great options out there that they may not be taking advantage of. Yeah, and for me, it's it's if you can make a choice like that, you're opening up a slot for a truck driver who needs to get his truck to market, for right. a person that really needs to get from A to B and their car is the only way they're going to get there. It just, we have to work together on this problem. Um, it is a it, it, it requires us to think individually, which we're good at, and I'm good at it. I mean, I'm not pointing any fingers here. I mean, I get in my car many days without thinking about this question. But it's, it's, so it is very much an individual choice, but it's also within a collective context, and we are all operating in a collective context, and it's just getting people to, you know, it's like when you walk out of a room, turn off the light. Mm -hmm. That's a social action, mm -hmm. turning it off. It doesn't need to be on. Mm -hmm. It's a really a conservative yeah. idea. It's conserving the resource. Yep. Oh, sorry. Please. Yes. Amanda, quick question. You had indicated that there was a the innovative grant program. Mm -hmm. um, how much is actually in that program available? Uh, so I think, um, Commissioner Simpson, in the last couple cycles, we set aside around a um, hundred. $100,000 a year uh, to run that program and so we have a competitive process that's um, open to any number of organizations for that. So it's not a huge amount that we're talking about, um, but it's it was kind of a test in the last couple of years to really see if a program like that might be effective and we've seen huge dividends in those investments. So yeah. is, oh, go please. You might be asking what I'm about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> is it oversubscribed? <laughs> Have they had a lot of interest? I mean, if what if we put more money in it? Mm -hmm. Was it oversubscribed? Are there? Yeah, I think we saw significant interest in it. Um, we've also tried to um, target some of what we're looking for each time. So if we know there's a specific need, like nighttime workers or pupil transportation, we might kind of target that as a theme as we're going and doing the advertising. And even when narrowed to those themes, we're still seeing a lot of interest. Yeah, it was really that because I'm, I'm just curious as to is it just a commission directive to add additional resources if need be to that program? Like say for example, there's something that we're curious in understanding or investigating about the system, something on the innovative side of things and could we beef up that program to solicit proposals from outside organizations to, to tap into those funds? Well, I would like to say absolutely because it's my program and I want more money. Um, of course, I think that comes at a cost, so I, I guess I defer to, to maybe Travis and, and others in thinking about what those trade-offs are, but I think certainly there would be opportunity for, for if you have specific interest in some certain types of applications or projects that we can try to beef that program up. Well, and I would also use it as an opportunity that if there's something that you think that we should be looking into, we need to be seeking an area that can be trying some of those pilots. Sure. And so we could think about it the opposite way, sure. where um, because deploying some of these new technologies and being able to think ahead, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's that we don't have the funding. Uh, we're spending the money. Where do we want to spend it? Mm -hmm. And on some of these new initiatives, um, I think what I'm hearing from the commission is we want to start trying some things and um, picking regions that might work or being selective about what we'd like to um, be able to try and learn from is something that we would be supportive of. Is that an accurate statement? Mm -hmm. And we're feeling awful generous today, too. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. I see she's writing it down. That's good. Commission said they'd give more money. Yeah, I would just I, I, I would I, I would just encourage you that if there are options out there in the world that you've investigated or come across or learned about, then we would probably want to hear what those are first and then see what options we could look into to follow up regarding okay. that. So some pilot project ideas and bringing those forward. Great. Scooters. Scooters. You know, if you fall off it because you were hit by Ashton Kutcher, you can get a photo with him. <laughs>
was in the Thank movie. you for a thought-provoking <laughs> presentation. Yes, absolutely. As you Thank can you. tell, our thoughts are going all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Next, let's have a discussion, um, an update, rather, on the transition plan for the ADA settlement agreement and progress um, on that work. I think we're actually on time. Well done. Hello. Greetings, uh, Chair Bainey, members of the Commission. I'm Dick Upton, the ADA Program Unit Manager. I'm here today with Angela Crane uh, from the Office of Civil Rights and Lisa Strader from my unit uh, to provide you with an informational uh, update on the uh, Oregon's Americans with Disability Act Transition Plan and our settlement agreement. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Angela. Sure. Good afternoon, Chair Bainey and, and members of the Commission. I'm Angela Crane, Manager for ODOT's Office of Civil Rights. The transi transition plan is an ADA Title II requirement of, pub of any public entity with 50 or more employees. The purpose of the transition plan is to identify barriers to accessibility and provide a schedule for the public entity to address those barriers. This is a 30-year plan with five-year updates that identify progress and allow for adjustments. This is ODOT's third update to the plan, with the third <coughs> update most recently in June of 2017, which you approved. These photos represent some of the elements on or along the transportation system that are required to be compliant under the transition plan. Part of assessing deficiencies is to inventory these transportation system elements. Progress includes updated inventories, uh, inventory tools such as map capture to more accurately and efficiently assess required elements and sidewalks being inventoried and added through the adopted Oregon bicycle and pedestrian plan. DMV buildings are examples of ODOT public buildings that need to be fully accessible. Progress to date includes ODOT facilities department completing its assessment of all ODOT buildings, both owned and leased. Curb ramps and pedestrian signals are both transition plan and settlement agreement elements. The transition plan and settlement agreement are two different documents. The transition plan is a requirement and the settlement agreement is a legal document as a result of a lawsuit. While these documents overlap, they contain different requirements and timelines. I will now introduce you to Lisa, who will walk you through the updates of the settlement agreement. Good afternoon, um, Chair Bainey and Commissioners. Thank you. Again, my name is Lisa Strader. I'm the ADA Program Manager. I'm sorry, the ADA Planning Manager. I have a new title. Um, and so I, want, I did want to talk to you about um, the requirements of the settlement agreement. As Angela said, this is the result of a lawsuit that was filed in February of 2016. Um, there was significant mediation and negotiations, and we had the agreement approved by the courts in March of 2017. Uh, like the transition plan, you've seen it before. The agreement came to you in May of 2017. Um, unlike the transition plan, the settlement agreement has a set 15-year compliance schedule. So this slide um, talks about the main or identifies the main elements in the settlement agreement. I have some specific slides uh, for some of these bullet points, so I won't go over, over every single one of them here on this slide. Um, one of our very first actions after we um, had the agreement approved was to hire an accessibility consultant. That is a entity with national knowledge of ADA. Um, we hired that firm in conjunction with our plaintiffs as required in the agreement. And we've been actively working with the consultant on the policies, practices, and procedures related to ADA and the transportation system since then. Um, the lawsuit largely focused on pedestrian signals and curb ramps. So as it relates to pedestrian signals, we provided our first inventory of those as required by the end of last year. We inventoried and, and shared that inventory. Um, we also inventoried um, or updated the inventory of our curb ramps and provided that at the end of last year as well. So curb ramps are, um, while the, the agreement has multiple um, elements, curb ramps are the most talked about, most noticeable, um, and they are what 
uh, we'll have to remediate um, in the next 15 years. So that's the most significant element that gets discussed. This is a matrix that um, shares with you what we learned from the settlement agreement inventory collection. Uh, so good, fair, poor, and missing, just as a clarification, missing is a subset of poor. So if you were to run that column of numbers, you would, you would, um, it would not total what's at the bottom there. Um, to complete the inventory, we measured over um, 11 elements on each curb ramp. Some of those were measured multiple times. Um, we're now um, completing a quality assurance, quality control of that inventory. Um, we collected over 750,000 points of data, and we want to be sure that those are all um, accurate. It's our corporate database. We'll be issuing an updated inventory when that is done, and we expect that in the next couple months. So what this matrix identifies um, is in the poor category uh, that we will have about 25,000 curb ramps that over the next 15 years we will have to remediate or make um, compliant. So a fairly big lift. Um, I think that um, showing you what good, fair, poor, and missing actually looks like is really helpful in the discussion. So the photo on the left is a good curb ramp. It's fully compliant. Um, this particular picture also shows you some of the ODOT standards that we've put in place to help us be sure we're building compliant curb ramps. So the colored, the yellow panel at the bottom, uh, um, for ODOT, those are truncated domes. Yellow is our standard. And there's also a texture to those panels. Um, there's some measurements on there that are probably <laughs> difficult to read, but, but every element of a curb ramp has to have a certain dimension or a certain slope. And then the red panels are an, another element of our standards that we've um, enacted, and that gives us a way to transition from the corner that we're building curb ramps on to the sidewalk that already existed. Trying to just build that right, right there was um, not um, working out so well, and those are a new um, standard then. The middle curb ramp is what is known as a fair curb ramp. So a fair curb ramp is only missing that color and textured panel, the truncated dome. So the other 10 elements are fully compliant. And then missing just literally means there's a blunt curb. So a lot of people have wondered if missing means we didn't collect the inventory. We did. Um, we have to go back and put curb ramps in those locations. So this slide shows you the extremes of poor, which is everything else. And the inventory matrix um, the, the vast majority of our inventory is poor. Um, so on the left, that curb ramp is what we would call functionally a barrier. There's probably almost no one that would look at that and not agree that poor is an appropriate category for that. We've been building curb ramps. Curb ramps have been a requirement of ADA for almost 30 years. Um, this was probably built both to an earlier standard and almost three decades ago. And so. Um, those two elements alone make this curb ramp look the way it does. I, I seriously doubt that it looked this way when we built it. I don't have a photo that, that proves that. The photo on the right shows a curb ramp that was built in 2015, so just three years ago. Um, the uh, people in the photo are measuring that curb ramp. Um, that curb ramp was also not compliant, um, so therefore poor under what we are um, what's available to us in the settlement agreement. Um, in this case, um, there are no dimensions on it, but the panel that um, is being stood on is on one side um, too steep a slope. There's another panel on that same corner that's also too steep as um, just a point of what um, is out of compliance there. So this is a, pan a curb ramp that for most users is usable as intended, but um, the standards exist because there's um, you know, significant research by the Access Board to identify what the requirements need to be, and this did fail in 2015. Um, we require our contractors to give us compliant curb ramps before we pay them, so this one is no longer non-compliant. It is now compliant. Um, as I mentioned, the agreement has many elements, so um, the um, ability to communicate with the, d the department on comments, questions, concerns, or requests uh, was noted um, in negotiations. So ODOT has always accepted and um, addressed comments and concerns from the public, but it was identified that because we're so big and dispersed, 
um, and that we didn't have a specific process that wasn't always complete, consistent, or well documented. So we now have a very thorough, complete, consistent process in place um, that we use. This is the form that is um, located in several areas on our website. And we also have a group of people in the department that thoroughly reviews and vets these for their um, consistent and compliant and gets back to the public um, who contacted us. Um, so while this process is really specifically laid out in the settlement agreement, it is an informal process by comparison to the complaint process in the federal ADA Title II requirements. Um, this slide goes back to talking about the curb ramps and the approximately 25,000 that we have to deliver over the um, next 15 years. So um, it's a compliance schedule. We have five. We have three five-year targets, not 15 one-year targets. So by the end of 2022, we have 30%, 45% in another five years, and then all of them by the end of that time. Um, to get to 7,600 curb ramps in the first five years, we are deliberately starting slowly um, and learning how best to deliver compliant curb ramps with the appropriate amount of design. Um, ODOT standard is right now that we um, design every curb ramp. We used to build curb ramps from standard drawings. And um, if you can think back to the slides that showed you what curb ramps looked like, there aren't a lot of standard curb ramps. It isn't easy to give a drawing and say, go build all of these on every one, on every one of these corners. So today we're designing each one individually. Um, we are looking at ways through pilot projects to identify the best approaches for all the different complexities of curb ramps. So, you know, just to simplify, easy, medium, and difficult curb ramps. So after this learning, we'll be initiating curb ramp only projects um, to move those numbers to build the 7,600 curb ramps in the first five years. We'll be doing that in virtually every city and county in the state at some point over the 15 years, certainly. And we, um, I want to assure you that we have been working with our public agency partners there, and they know that this is coming, and um, um, we'll be working with them on every project. So even though we're working to drive down the costs, um, building 25,000 curb ramps in the next 15 years will not be an inexpensive endeavor. We um, are obligated by federal law to get Anybody, if we allow anybody through our work zone, we have to allow all users through. So we're really very good at getting vehicles through our work zones. Um, we now have a temporary pedestrian accessible route plan, um, a policy that um, is um, giving us guidance on how to get pedestrians, including um, uh, people with disabilities, through or around our work zones. Um, the policy that we have now was reviewed by the accessibility consultant, so that's a really good example of what that firm does to our benefit. Um, they also were here in July and visited active work zones in all five regions. Um, we talked to them after their visit, of course, and they gave us really good feedback, both some positive things that we're doing and um, some guidance on, on things that we need to change, and we're actively working with our project teams on um, implementing those changes, improving our practices here, and um, implementing those through the rest of this construction season and certainly for next year. Again, a lot of other things that are um, included in the agreement, and I'll quickly highlight these. Um, the plaintiff priority projects um, is a list of projects that the plaintiffs were allowed to provide to us, so their top priorities and $5 million in the agreement to start addressing those. We're actively working the first two locations, Klatsk and I in Springfield. I mentioned the policy review already, so we're continuing that. We have multiple policies that need to be reviewed. Um, the agreement requires, and my understanding is that the commission um, requested that we do significant outreach to our public agency partners to be sure that they knew what we've been through, why we think it happened, what we're doing about it, how it affects them. I speak almost weekly to an area commission on transportation, a metropolitan planning organization, or another uh, League of Oregon Cities, Association of Oregon Counties type group. Um, I also speak regularly to the Association of Oregon Centers for Independent Living, our plaintiffs, and other um, groups that represent the community of people with disabilities, so we're engaging our users. And um, uh, 
they really appreciate our willingness to talk to them. So annual reporting, um, your packet included our annual report, ODOT's annual report, and the annual report that the accessibility consultant is required to provide as well. I just want to note that we did get a couple um, positive comments out of their, they'd been working with us for about seven months by the time they were required to, to write a report, and they noted that they um, felt we were really receptive to their guidance and that the plans that they've heard us talking about in terms of meeting the milestones in the agreement are very likely to get us there. So we were really happy about that. On the next slide, um, we'll address the program structure. But first, I just wanted to tell you about training, because um, those two bullet points were a little maybe out of order. But training is really important. Um, we needed to figure out how it is that we were not delivering compliant curb ramps when we fully intended to be. So we developed a certification program, a um, curb ramp inspection certification program. Um, so it's a two-day training. We've put through about 1,800 um, people, ODOT inspectors, consultants that do inspection work for us, our designers and consultant designers, um, contractors, and um, we've offered that and made it available to our city and county partners, and they've taken us up on that. We'll continue to offer that training, and in addition, we're um, developing recertification training and some education and awareness training. A question about the training. Is yes. part of that training also, <clears throat> excuse me, being able to um, utilize a system um, that similar to like the ADA for a, for a day program to where you would actually be in a wheelchair for a short period of time and where you can, because there's one thing to be um, having participated in trying to traverse an area with part of a side, sidewalk sort of on one side of the road and then having to go across the road to get to the rest of the sidewalk, which is kind of there. And a ramp, the slope on a ramp, um, I could not fully appreciate until I myself found myself in a wheelchair. Um, and then they also do visual impairment and a variety of other things. Is that part of the training? Um, Chair Bainey and Commissioners, that would be part of what we are calling education and awareness training that we have not yet developed. Okay. Um, we have not provided any of that kind of training or awareness training to that extent in our certification training. But we certainly talk about um, the fact that at least everybody in my vision right now, I think, walked in here, um, and that not all of us use the, the curb ramps that are being built, that the firms are designing and building and inspecting in the same way. So we do try to raise awareness, just but more today, just as part of a presentation, not with um, user examples. And, but we do, we do acknowledge that that would be beneficial, and we in, um, are, again, talking about education and awareness training. It's, um, I think it's pretty eye-opening. Mm -hmm. I think even when uh, I was a staffer for Senator Hatfield when the ADA was being voted on, <clears throat> and um, he got in a wheelchair for half a day and went around, and, and it, I think it took us about an hour before he was like, yeah, we got to do it. <clears throat> but um, we've come a long way, but I think it's, I mean, I think it's just one of those things that it, it just changes your perspective hugely to, try to navigate with it and you see where where it works and where it doesn't and I think it's something that we may want to try just as a commission because it's we're setting policy if you can feel what it's like for an individual um, and then also for your team I don't know if you do those types of activities but um, the community uh, would love to share what it is that they experience and I think we, in setting policy and providing that work, have a responsibility to also have a feel for what that's like as well. So I just encourage that type of activity um, when it's possible. Please. We just, <clears throat> the neighborhood I live in, I just went through this process of having these curb cuts put in with the yellow pads. And that was last summer. And then you were talking about whether they're com compliant. Uh, then this last fall, they came back and kind of ground, grounded up the roads again because they had a little gap between the road and the end of the curb. And you could just, you know, as soon as you looked at it, you could say, well, you know, I could use that. But there are users that couldn't because of that gap. And so I think the if that's an example of what's going on around the state, you know, that getting on people to be actually fix 
fix them and put them in place properly is, I think, a big going to be a big part of the success of of this. Uh, otherwise, you get the investment, and people say, "Well, it still doesn't work for me for some reason." So, even though I wondered why it was being done twice in one year, I now understand it. So, thank you. <clears throat> Um, Chair Bainey and Commissioners, thank you for those comments. They're very pertinent. And um, our accessibility consultant, I, I don't know that I'm going to get the phrase exactly right, but she points out that um, this is a minority group that any one of us could join at any point. So knee surgery, car accident, illness, um, and the lip that you talk about is something that even um, somebody pushing a stroller, pulling a wagon, pulling luggage, um, uh, right, uh, and those lips are, yeah, they look, pr they do look pretty innocent, but they really can be quite a barrier, so we recognize that, and, and thank you. Um, if we if we start developing some kind of training like that, we'll be sure we, we make it available to you Include as well. Include us, please. Okay, definitely. Yeah. I think you should develop it. Yeah, I, I would really. Just do it. It feels like a priority, so if there's uh, a piece there that we might, again, we're feeling generous today, apparently. Great. Um, I'm going to take Amanda's <laughs> cue and write this down. Write Commissioners this down. want the uh, training and tomorrow. And you know, the kickoff, the, the kickoff <laughs> Matt is be, never going to leave me here. <laughs> <laughs> the kickoff might be that we in, engage that type of activity and kind of set that pace, so um, we might reverse it the other way. So, what's the, What is the life expectancy of a, of a curb ramp, curb cut? Uh, Chair Beanie and Commissioners, I've never been asked that before, but given the, the appearance of the one that I showed you that's poor, we um, don't have a requirement to replace them unless we trigger um, them. So there are certain things that we do as a transportation agency in the way of repaving roads that would require us to replace curb ramps and bring them up to the current standards, just like something in your house might trigger you to so do something. If so you go back uh, maybe one or two slides. Um, and I'm going to give oops, Commissioner oops, Simpson the, the opportunity yeah, to uh, I, I, go I, ahead and that, leave. Wait, wait. That, that, Great. You had thank you. Forward one more. Sean, I'm going to miss you. Sure. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to leave you. Thank you, yes, guys. Sir. Thanks for staying. One forward one more. There was like uh, one more. It was the one that had the, the numbers, the good, the... Oh, the matrix. Maybe that. There. there you go. So no, back more. my question is, no, that you had it, you had it. Oh, had that's it. not the good fair point I'm missing. That's so, just the... That's so my question is, by the time you get to 2028 20, to 2032, do you have to redo all those ones that you did and that you finished in 2022? Chair Beany and Commissioners, we do not, unless we do something that triggers ones that were built to the standard, say, in 2023, um, we would have to bring those up to the current standard. But, but otherwise, um, when we put them in place compliantly now, they're compliant until we do something that, and, and only then if the standard had changed in the interim. So does, does trigger, did I explain triggered well enough? Um, so where you where there's a an activity so that says bring everything up to standard. Yeah, um, but I think you're standard. you're essentially saying that it's similar to building um, codes that if you yes. can have code standards that have been improved upon, but you don't those are not triggered unless you actually go in for a remodel or you're doing something that would trigger that. Chair and commissioners, that, yes. I think um, maybe you're asking also, does it like the yellow part of it? I don't know what I mean. Does it it's, it just seems like there's a wear and tear where we're, yeah. I mean, this is a, we'll, we'll get to where we comply with the litigation and the obligation of the act, but it's a perpetual mm -hmm. renewing and updating like, like roads. Right. And that's probably the triggering yeah. when you have to go into that right away. I suspect that you would have to then, that would create um, some sort of improvements if you're coming in and doing an overlay or reconstruction that you may, that might trigger, I don't know what the triggering pieces are. But that might trigger for you to then have to go in and redo the curb ramps. Yes, Chair Mady and Commissioners, there's very, FHWA provides us very specific information on what triggers and what does not. And the gentleman in the back, I think they're giggling because we're just tearing it up up here in terms of our terminology. <laughs> anyway, please go right ahead. Okay, Let's see if I can catch up again. Do you know you have your mic right. on? Um, so, 
recognizing the level of effort that's required to continue the work of the transition plan and implement the work of the settlement agreement, the department has identified some specific resources and as well as guidance committees. So the oversight committee was established in March. They are going to um, provide the strategy to the 25 delivery of the 25,000 curb ramps. Um, also probably talk about any any major policy uh, information that um, needs to as it relates to the program. The um, statewide working group is uh, represented um, with every region um, today. The program is managed locally. That's what you see the ADA management team there. Um, it's managed centrally and um, it works very closely with these other two groups as we early in this um, effort identify how we're going to deliver on all of it. Um, but it is the intention that um, someday curb ramp only projects will look just like any other project ODOT does and they'll be delivered by the regions. So the statewide working group has region representation so that as we're doing the early work and taking information from the inventories and, and figuring out efficient projects that the regions who are eventually going to inherit all of those were part of the conversation. Next slide, please. So going forward, we're going to continue learning from the pilot um, program. So I didn't give you a lot of detail on those. We um, have several different um, pilots that we're working, and again, we're, we're looking to find um, the right amount of design. So limited to no design on really simple corners and the right amount of design as it gets more complex and with a recognition that a fully um, um, uh, signalize the intersection or corners with steep slopes or very limited um, constrained um, property may require may always require some level of design but um, we're also looking to build the capacity in the industry with that and um, we um, know we're going to be working statewide. Um, 25,000 in 15 years is a, is a big number. So we've been um, piloting also um, efforts with Angela's shop through um, Office of Civil Rights using um, certified firms. And we have um, two certified firms on contract now. One was um, contracted with specifically um, through um, a bid process for certified firms. Uh, we've started, um, ODOT started a peer uh, group conversation with other DOTs, so we have cities, states, and counties involved um, throughout the nation. I mean, New York's on the call, somebody from Phoenix, Sacramento, Texas. Um, so we talk every other month. Um, these are DOTs that have both gone before us and are further along, are right where we are now, are in the middle of negotiating a lawsuit, and some that have never been there and hope they never get there and want to learn from us. So that's been really uh, fruitful. Um, as I mentioned, the um, working group and the oversight committee and the ADA program unit are all going to be working together to develop um, an effective way to deliver all of these curb ramps and of course everything else that's required under the settlement agreement and the transition plan. Um, and that um, Efficient project delivery will be something you'll hear more about probably next spring. We will be coming back to you with um, more information on that as well as um, probably a funding, funding request. And then, of course, annually we'll be bringing you the, this kind of a report um, as a part of the requirement for um, our annual reporting. So with that, um, our presentation is concluded. You've already asked some questions, but we're certainly happy to answer more if you have them. Thank you so much. Well, we're very interested and grateful for your work. Um, it's the right thing to do, and it's uh, really improving individuals, their opportunity to be independent and um, creating a system that meets their needs, and that's obviously and safely, that's one of our goals. Do we have any other comments or um, considerations? Okay. Thank you very much. And I think before we go to uh, redistribution, we are going to have a brief safety discussion. We had an opportunity this morning for those of you that may not have been here to hear from um, OSP in terms of um, just uh, 
enforcement and on our side fatalities uh, increasing at a level that just really one is too many but the number that obviously we saw this morning is um, jaw-dropping and uh, heartbreaking and so uh, we asked the team to come back with some uh, maybe some thoughts in terms of if we were to identify additional funding that meets our constitutional restrictions in terms of the gas tax um, and that are on the system not on the OSP enforcement side obviously um, we can only do our part but um, thank you for the quick turnaround and it looks like our brain trust is in front of us and so please kick us off yeah, Chair Bainey, uh, good conversation during the lunch hour as well on this topic. So we've put a put some heads together, if you will, and if it uh, pleases, pleases the commission, our thought was to bring you back a plan next month. And the thought we're working on is our All Roads Transportation Safety Program, otherwise known as ARTS, already has in it built into it a systemic um, safety program so those systemic measures really focus on the two-lane rural highways if you will where we have what well, I think 66 percent of fatalities are in those locations due to lane departures leaving the roadway etc so uh, our proposal likely will be how can we dedicate some more funding uh, to that program for some immediate return on that investment um, talking with a couple folks including Mr. Sip to my right and Mr. Winshammer how fast can we deploy those projects? Uh, we're talking about rumble strips, curb warning signs, uh, some of those uh, quicker actions that we can take and, and hopefully make uh, further investments in safety, knowing that we can't simply pay for more troopers on the road. Right. So if that would be okay with you, we'd bring back a proposal focusing in that area. Uh, I think what we need from you is how big do you wanna go? Right. And we'll have to consider where that comes from. So in the spirit of punting, I would like to also punt a little bit and offer a suggestion of, could you give us a menu? Could you give us, if the investment were to increase by 500,000, a million, if we got to 2 million, would that please the commission in terms of, um, because if I, were, if I were to pick a number, it would just be arbitrary and I wouldn't know what that might get us and if it would even be meaningful. And I think what the commission wants to do is take an action and not just make a statement. So um, what would truly be meaningful in those areas where we know that we have existing issues? And um, I think I'd also encourage us to look at things like, um, is there research behind the lights on for safety signage where people just turning your headlights on actually reduces your chances of a head on? Um, are there some of those types of things um, that are, you know, seem simple, um, but may make a difference? Yeah, I would just say, Chair Bainey, absolutely, we can do that. So it's good to have your feedback on what it is you want to see, and we'll prepare a menu of options for your consideration. And then again, uh, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues to see if what I've said is um, supported. <laughs> um, we were originally looking at the funding from redistribution and um, had identified around a 10% of that funding. Obviously, we're looking at a different pot of money, um, but I think the number that we had kind of just arbitrarily thrown out was around uh, 2.7. Now, is it 2 million? But I, I probably wouldn't be headed into the 3, 4, 5 range, just to give you some narrowing of the menu. Thoughts? I, I would just say that, I mean, it's really our fundamental obligation. I mean, we can expand all over the place <clears throat> and improve our system, but if we're going backwards on safety, we, we are failing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Even though I know the, the population's going up, there's more distracted driving, there's more, um, I don't know, it, 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 altered driving from, from maybe from maybe edibles or other other or things. Californians or Californians driving. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Blame it on California. But, but I, I do think, you know, we have to look at what, so it's lane departures, you say it's 66% are on, on two lane roads. Um, you know, so what about reflective lining? Are we still doing that and, and signage and, and making more safety corridors? And, and But it does seem like we are, to, to hear the report that we had today and, and to have Oregon State Police here, um, to me it was kind of a one-two punch and it just seems like 
it's not an emotional response, but a substantive, why aren't we doing more here if we're going the wrong way um, on, on safety? And I just, it just seems like, is it, you know, we've got to look at where, where is it? Is it just, is it kind of universally all over the place? Is it just teen drivers? Is it, you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and I think in the menu, it's like, what's the thing we can do that, that gets the, is it, if it's going up in any one particular place, can we have a more surgical, you know, punch at that? But, but, but maybe it's not, and maybe it's just all over the place and we got to do lots of it, but it seems like, uh, some in investments got to make a change here. I agree. Uh, and I like the idea, Madam Chair, of a menu. I would like to see at least, I would like to see one of the options be to get um, the ratio to the objective that was stated today, um, which I think was 50% of, I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but to get to, um, I'd have to get the materials back out, <clears throat> but to get them to um, uh, the level that they were trying to get to, I like I like Commissioner O'Halloran's idea of surgical strikes, but I also like the idea of getting them to the ratio that they were discussing with us. I think the challenge would be that, unfortunately, we won't, with gas tax being constitutionally right. restricted, we probably won't be able to have on the menu assisting in the enforcement side. Right. But maybe if we take into consideration some of our more rural areas, which do happen to have the two lane, which happen to have a number of those crossovers, we know that their response and their enforcement is also um, lean, if not just flat out non-existent. Right. And so if the, maybe that's the surgical strike is to those areas that we can complement with the information from OSP, knowing that we can't add enforcement, but we can add safety features that might augment some of those challenges. Good point. Uh, and to the extent <laughs> it allows, frees up any resources they have sure. to move toward that. Just thinking of uh, some collaboration with them to yeah, ensure right. that we've got um, the best options in front of us that move the needle, um, so, you know, uh, materially, uh, so that we're making progress. So. I, I would encourage you to come back to us as a way, in the way you're suggesting, and I like the idea of a menu. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, I, I think that um, it would be more compelling for us to try to obligate some of our NHTSA funds, which could be used for this, <clears throat> um, if they were at full headcount. Mm. It's it's hard for me to make a make a case that we should do it when they have 77 open positions. So it's like, okay, that that is a problem that we can't help them with, but if those positions were open and they were saying we're still having an issue here, we'll say, okay, now let's help, let's see what resources, what pots of money can we use for that, and I think NHTSA funds can be used there, but um, I think there's also a question about where can you know, the, the HR, the personal, personal management side of the state help recruit and fill, are, these, are they not salary competitive? What's the issue where you have 77 open spots? Yeah, I think that's also something we'd like to hear about. So it really is comprehensive. Why aren't why are they having trouble filling the seventy seven? What could be done there? Uh, what can we do that is permissible under our restrictions? How much can we do? Um, is is there federal funding like NHTSA funding that could be a part of the solution? So the menu shouldn't just be a dollar level. It should be a kind of a packaging together of something that used a variety of resources to actually make progress. I, I do, th it's shocking that, you know, we get 77 open positions there. This reminds me of when we went to the tri-state meeting in San Francisco and we're hearing about, I think it was there, we were hearing about <clears throat> the deficit in truck drivers oh, and how goodness, there's right. a, just a dearth. Yeah of applicants for truck driving positions and you've got truck drivers aging out of the economy and you don't have anyone behind them and we are a very truck dependent economy. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So exactly. Chair Bainey, if I Please. may, two points. Uh, you heard Superintendent Hampton speak about the partnership that we already have between OSP and ODOT. So I think this assignment and this discussion really engages that work group that's already um, ready to go, teamed up, working exactly these issues 
uh, maybe not so much on the OSB staffing level, because that's not generally our uh, mission, if you will, mm -hmm. but we'll rely on that work group to bring you back a comprehensive overview of what are we doing with safety, what's our coordination with law enforcement, and potentially what's a menu of options you could invest in in between our normal investment cycle we're at right now. I would also add our law enforcement presence in work zones. You're gonna hear about that in a couple months. Um, that's spot on. We can pretty much create as much funding as we can to have their presence in our work zones, but they don't have the resources to bring that presence. So right. to, to Commissioner O'Halloran's point, uh, we have the funding sitting there, uh, but they're strapped. And it's amazing to me that they can even engage in that conversation, giving the conversation this morning. So. We'll bring that comprehensive uh, discussion to you, try to frame up uh, our safety program in a larger context, uh, and then bring you a menu of options. Excellent. Thank you. Good. Uh, so next topic. Yes, please. Redistribution. First, first question, how are the Whoppers? They're really good. Do you want a Pop-Tart? No. <laughs> I think the Whoppers should become a, a, a the O'Halloran Whoppers should become a regular item yeah, on our menu. I'm, I'm feeling good about them. I'm feeling very, I'm very strong on the Whoppers. We need to thank John Day. It's really Chester's at John Day. Yeah, that got us. I'll did. send him a personal note. Yeah, personal note. So uh, I'm sorry, we're getting a little. Squirrely. No, I did that because we're getting uh, close to the end of the agenda here today. So uh, introductions: uh, Macklin, Interim Highway Division Administrator. To my right. There we go. All right, I'm on. Uh, Craig Sip, Region 5, Eastern Oregon Manager. And Ryan Winchermann, the ODOT Regional Manager. So we're now part of the agenda today. Uh, we've got three items in front of you, really funding uh, decisions and actions for you to take today really related to um, the first being redistribution, some unanticipated federal funds. We'll walk through that conversation first. We'll then turn it over to Mr. Winchammer for the next action item. Uh, around some project changes and a SIP amendment. And then lastly, turn to Mr. SIP for the last item on your agenda, an important project and SIP amendment there. So three separate actions, but we're all up here at once. And I think Mr. Winchimer will likely bring up some other folks for his item as well. So the uh, first item in on your agenda, uh, this is a good opportunity for us to be talking about today, a story that uh, has not always been our situation. Um, when we build the SIP, and more importantly, when we build the current step that we're building today and constructing those projects, the 2018-2021 step, back in 2015, we sat down with you and approved an allocation of what we anticipated would be our federal funds. Uh, so that was a number of years ago, and we're now de deploying and delivering those projects. In that assumption is a thing called redistribution, which in essence, and it's more complicated than this, but the simple approach is, Every year, each state needs to utilize all of their federal funds or obligate all of their federal funds. Uh, when they don't, when some states don't, that money goes back into a pool and gets redistributed to other states that can utilize those funds. So the window of opportunity we have is very short. It's essentially the month of September to determine what you're gonna use those funds on. So we always build in an estimate of how much redistribution we've gotten in the past and what we plan to get in the future, but it's uh, an unknown, so it's an estimate. Now, this year, uh, it was an exciting day. We received a much larger share of redistribution than we have uh, ever anticipated. Uh, so with that, leads the question to what we're in front of you today is how should we direct those funds in an urgent manner? Um, so we're talking about $27 million above and beyond what our estimate was. So in front of you is a series of four projects in discussions with the director and other agency leadership. We put together the following recommendation to move four projects of statewide significance and priority in front of you. Our criteria that we used was, do they need more funds? So is there a funding shortfall? And the answer to that is yes on all four of these projects. The second is, what kind of legislative direction do we have for each of these initiatives? The first three, uh, which Mr. Winsheimer will speak to in a second, really focused on the I-205, I-5 at Rose Quarter improvements and our pre-work on tolling or value pricing as you just had a robust discussion on. And the last one being a very important safety project on I-84 in Eastern Oregon, which Mr. Sip can talk about. So I'll turn it over to these two to maybe give the high points 
um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So a general question before we kick that part off. So we don't necessarily have a lot more money in the system for other states. It seems odd that at a time of, you know, it maybe it just seems like the states around us are really investing in transportation and there's a lot of discussion about infrastructure. Any guesses as to, or, or is there a reason that there'd be so uh, many dollars within the system that went unallocated and that are part of this redistribution now? Yeah, Chair Bainey, great question. So the simple answer is those other states didn't utilize all their they funds. Just, the larger answer is things like the infra grants is a great example. So those large federal grant opportunities that they open up, mm -hmm. uh, that also is a share of the obligation or the uh, appropriation uh, of funds. Those did not get okay. doled out as quickly as originally okay. planned. So that's a, a major part of this conversation. Okay. But uh, there's several, uh, as Mr. O'Halloran I'm sure knows, uh, several buckets of appropriations and they'll have their own rules around them. So that leads into this conversation as well. But the simple approach is uh, other states not Just getting to those funds. And we- crazy. If Director <laughs> Garrett was here, uh, I'm sure Travis would say the same thing. <laughs> Uh, we always position ourselves to not be in that situation, right. uh, and we're happy to get redistribution. Great. Well, hats off to you guys for being ready. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So please. Um, I'm going to try the new protocol. So, uh, Chair Bainey, Vice Chair Van Brocklin, other members of the commission, uh, Ryan Winchheimer, yeah, outgoing members of the commission, <coughs> other one member of the commission. Um, before I get into my prepared talking points, I do want to just say it, it's not as easy as it sounds to position ourselves um, in order to, to receive these funds. It really is a dedicated effort um, on all of the region managers' parts in terms of actually getting our projects out the door, which is a challenge. And then obviously everybody who's part of the team on the project delivery side in the tech center and OPO and DOJ and everyone else that has to uh, help fall in line and actually help get those projects obligated. It, it is a real challenge. It's something that we uh, focus our efforts on uh, every year uh, in order to position ourselves for this. So it is kind of a almost a reward and for the fact that how much hard work and effort does go into making sure that we're meeting that obligation. Well, and I appreciate you being forthcoming with that because I don't know that we could truly appreciate what that looks like behind the scenes. And while we sit here with this opportunity saying, boy, aren't we lucky? It really isn't luck. It's right. intentional good work. And I know that that happens, but I appreciate that we can have that dialogue that you can help us highlight that so we can okay. fully appreciate your hard work. I, Thank you. I, I'd also like just, and this may have been asked while I was out of the room, but uh, so how, to, first of all, I agree with the chair's comments. Um, so how does, it, how does this compare with other years? I mean, is this a large, medium, small? So uh, Chair Bainey, Vice Chair Brocklin, uh, this is big. So in my memory of the last 15 years or so, and I'll look to Travis as well, I think we have one other time that maybe exceeded this, um, but this is rare. I think uh, we've been averaging closer to 25 million and we're at 52 million this year. So this surprised us a bit. Uh, that's why we're in front of you today. In our typical approach, if that number has come in above our estimate, we've really brought back to you maybe one or two projects, paving or bridge projects to add to the STIP or move off of our shelf program where we've already designed them or we're ready to go. So this is a pretty dramatic increase from what we've seen in the past. We need to approve them quickly and then get going on them tonight. Yes. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on that. <laughs> and, uh, doing such a nice job in managing the projects. Uh, Chair Bainey, Vice Chair Van Brocklin, members of the Commission, uh, Ryan Winchheim, the ODOT Region 1 Manager. Um, as you are all well aware, the Rose Quarter Project, the I-205 widening, and uh, the additional planning work required to implement uh, tolling are all priorities established in HB 2017. And today's action allows us to continue work on these otherwise unfunded or underfunded priorities. Uh, so by dedicating the $17.1 uh, million of federal redistribution funds for I-205, Stafford Road to 99E, the project will enable uh, uh, us to maintain its design schedule consistent with our cost to complete report assumptions all the way through mid-2020 and will produce construction ready plans. So this is actually the final money necessary to really get us to the cusp of construction. Um, and so this is a, a great opportunity as we talked about, um, but it's also really important for maintaining our schedule and uh, which would otherwise, uh, we would run out of funding in March of next year. So this is a great opportunity. Um, by dedicating 
an additional $2 million to the Rose Quarter project, we're going to have sufficient funding to move forward with our CMGC owner's representative contract, our A&E design consultant contract, and our const uh, construction contractor uh, contract to inform the Rose Quarter cost to complete report that's due to the legislature in February of 2020. And so that's also an important milestone that these funds are going to help us achieve. Um, and then again, by dedicating the $3 million for additional planning work um, associated with the tolling effort, um, we're going to have sufficient funding to advance the process uh, to the cusp of NEPA. And so this, this is work that in our conversations regarding our application to Federal Highway, what work are we going to need to do? Uh, this is some of the work that is early work that we can start doing now that's going to prepare us to get into that NEPA phase. So the, the $3 million is important for uh, continuing, you know, sort of as fast as we can work. Uh, this money helps us get there faster. All right. Going with the new protocol, Chair Bainey, <laughs> Vice Chair Van Brocklin, Commissioner. Um, others. Others. <laughs> So the, the project we're talking about is the I-84 safety project, which goes in line very well with the earlier conversation that we had. When we talk about uh, Cabbage Hill and Meacham, um, that can bring fear to almost all the traveling public and especially our freight partners um, and uh, the freight industry. And so this project is going to make some huge advancements uh, around the safety within 84 between uh, the communities of Pendleton and Grand. The session of I-4 between Pendleton and the Grand is plagued with some of the highest crashes rates and frequencies that we see among the whole 84 corridor, making the segment a priority for improvement. The project includes $4 million allocated for, from the 2017 Keep Oregon Moving Transportation Bill. The project elements include a variety of upgrades and intelligent transportation improvements, and these include over a dozen new electronic message signs to provide information about weather, <coughs> roadway conditions, chain up areas and conditions, curb warning information, and other highway related messages. New weather stations and pavement condition sensors that will provide a ton of data to these signs and to the traveling public. Extra highway cameras, which is always very popular, especially in eastern Oregon. Curb warning signs, flashing beacons, cable barrier to prevent uh, crossovers that were, was brought up in conversations earlier today and over 10 miles of buried power lines to support these future upgrades are also part of the project. I think that's most exciting. We're laying the infrastructure along this project, uh, thinking that with the vision in, in front of us of there's things out there that we may not have think about or new technology, so we want to make sure we put that grid in place to take advantage of that. So uh, the additional $5 million in construction funding will allow this project to go to bid this fall and allow all the elements of the project be completed in one effort so that the weather sensors, signs, and other improvements will all work together in alignment. So this really completes the project, makes it whole, and, and I think will make some tremendous safety improvements along the corridor. Gosh. Okay. I think we have to have Ms. Ch Commissioner O'Halloran do these. Yes. <laughs> can I move them in block? Yes. Is that appropriate? You can. Um, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Van Brocklin, I would uh, move that we uh, that we appro the approval of items O, P, and Q. Is that right now? Oh, we did Q. O just, and P. Just N. I, I think we're we're just at redistribution, but I appreciate. Where are, wait? Where are we? <laughs> we're right here. So just okay. Request the approval to allocate higher than estimated federal I highway. Program funds for fiscal 2018. Is that yes. all we need? Yep. Okay. Sorry, I was getting. No, aggressive. that's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Great job. All right. Let's go on to the uh, step amendments. Thank you, um, Chair Bainey, Vice Chair Van Brocklin, members of the commission, um, Ryan Winsheimer, ODOT Region One Manager, and I have asked uh, Tova Peltz, my interim. Region Project Delivery Manager uh, to come before you to talk about the Farley Slide Project. Um, we're here today to request your approval to cancel the Farley Slide Project on Interstate 84 and to transfer those remaining funds from the project to construct the Interstate uh, 205 ATM project between Stafford Road and Highway 99E. And so that project is part of the larger overall um, I-205 widening project. This is the ATM portion of that. And so the funds that uh, we're 
uh, going to be uh, moving off of the Farley Slide project would go uh, to help fund that construction. And so the good news is um, it will stay within that operations program and it will be providing that safety and operational benefit that we've again been talking about um, here on that I-205 section. Okay. So as a reminder, the Farley Slide project was programmed back in the 2015-18 STIP uh, to stabilize an ancient landslide affecting um, roughly 300 linear feet of Interstate 84 in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area near Cascade Locks. Back in the year 2000, ODOT geologists and geotechnical engineers installed six inclinometers to monitor the slide and to develop the necessary data to develop a solution um, at that location. Even with all of that data and a significant amount of analysis done by ODOT professionals and our partners in the consultant community, we knew uh, that the project we had developed still carried risk. The good news story out of this project is that our design team and the construction inspectors developed and utilized a set of procedures to monitor and measure the outstanding risks um, during construction. These measures paid off in the sense that during construction, we were able to detect the presence of a previously undetected landslide even deeper underground than we had observed before the construction started. This knowledge allowed our geotechnical engineers, engineering geologists, and construction inspectors to identify the presence of this condition in a timely enough fashion to save the department $3.5 million that would otherwise have gone to continuing to construct a wall uh, that would ultimately not have addressed the issue we were trying to resolve and allows us to repurpose those uh, materials um, that were purchased for that project. We're able now to repurpose those uh, materials as part of a, a region two landslide uh, project. So as you know, uh, since the time this project was scoped, programmed and designed, ODOT staff has been working hard to improve our geological analysis and project development. I'd like to stop here and let you hear from Tova Peltz regarding the steps the department's taken to improve our processes and analysis uh, for this project. Tova? Have to push over. It's been difficult all day. There you go. There go. <laughs> All right. Hi. <laughs> my name is Topa Peltz, and I'm the Interim Project Delivery Manager in Region 1. Uh, my technical background is geotechnical engineering and engineering geology, and I'm actually the uh, former, uh, former manager of Region 1's geoenvironmental unit. I'm also, um, I was also a member of the Federal Highway Team that reviewed ODOT's geo program um, in tw early 2018, and I'm now on the work ODOT work group that's, look that's developing an implementation plan to meet Federal Highway's recommendations for the geo program. So I bring a lot of geo yes. stuff to the table. Anyhow, um, as Ryan said, I'm here to address the project in the context of our statewide geo program review and up upcoming changes to our geo program. First off, this project was designed and bid prior to Federal Highway's 2018 review of our geo program and the recommendations for raising the bar for ODOT's geotechnical engineering and engineering geology disciplines. Since Federal Highway's made its recommendations, ODOT has engaged in a process to establish a statewide approach to meet the recommendations. At this time, the team is working on this, which I'm part of, and is preparing to roll out an implementation plan for meeting the recommendations. The Federal Highway Review identified, it inc identified inconsistencies in how geotechnical engineering and engineering geology elements of projects are evaluated and approached on projects across ODOT. The review also observed inconsistencies in quality control measures across the agency. Overall, the review identified, identified that the risks associated with geotechnical engineering and engineering geology in our projects were not consistently addressed in either the project level or at, across the whole agency. For projects with geotech or engineering geology elements, foundations, retaining walls, landslides, rock falls, for example, there's always some risk associated with subsurface conditions, the soil, the rock, and the groundwater. We investigate these conditions with different types of explorations and monitoring, but even with these investigations, some uncertainty remains because, we, because these materials are inconsistent and we're only able to capture a finite amount of data. Due to uncertainties that exist in these conditions, it is critical that we engage qualified licensed technical professionals, geotechnical engineers, and engineering geologists early in our project delivery process to appropriately address risk assessment and risk management for geotech and engineering geology elements of our projects. Appropriately resourcing our projects with competent, qualified geotech engineers and engineering geologists as professionals, re professionals of record and peer reviewers is critical. In addition, engaging peer review and collaboration between these engineers, geologists, and peer reviewers early and often is also critical to evaluating the complexity of the projects, assessing risk, and appropriately conducting subsurface investigations, analyses, and design. So with these elements of the Federal Highway Review in mind, we, we look back at Farley to see how we did as a region and as an agency. The Farley project was outsourced to a qualified firm, which included experienced geotechnical engineers and engineering geologists. In Region 1, both our senior geotech engineer, who's a licensed geotech engineer and, P and professional engineer, 
and senior engineering geologist, who's also a licensed certified engineering geologist for the project reviewers. Geo risk was considered <clears throat> throughout the design, and in particular during discussions about constructability and completing wall construction in one season to limit risk during the wet season when we most often see landslide movement. Risk management was a consideration when we included monitoring throughout construction in the consultant contract. At the time when we began to see movement in the inclinometers during construction, the group of geotech engineers and engineering geologists re-engaged and added headquarters geotech staff as well to the conversation. This group also engaged with the project's construction project manager and ODOT's construction section to discuss and evaluate potential risks to the construction contract if slide movement continued and if we move forward with significant design changes under the contract. So how would this, be pro how would this project be different under a future GEO program? Well, first of all, changes to our scoping methods with a strong focus on risk assessment and quantification would have benefited this project and better address the unknowns of mitigating a landslide, constructability challenges, and the potential risks in budget and schedule. If we were scoping this project now, the assessment of risk would be front and center in scoping and estimating the project. Second, with the upcoming Advanced Investigation Program pilot, this project would have benefited from subsurface investigation monitoring, more subsurface investigation and monitoring earlier. In the case of projects with significant geo risks, landslides, for example, large fills with the potential for significant settlement, et cetera, advanced investigation allows earlier data collection, assessment and analysis, as well as the opportunity for longer term monitoring and the opportunity for multi-phased investigations based on observations during early investigations. The disciplines of geotech engineering and engineering geology contribute the greatest unknown risks to our projects and consequently necessitate the most front-end investigation and analysis and the most construction observation and monitoring during construction. Projects with substantial geotech risks um, need both a lot of front-end time for explorations and monitoring, but much more than the typical STIP projects, and also they require a lot of geotechnical and engineering geologist engagement during construction to monitor and assess, con assess conditions as they're encountered and to evaluate whether observed site conditions are consistent with those assumed during design and analysis. As Ryan mentioned, our use of construction monitoring and ongoing construction engineering from our geotech consultant and Region 1 staff allowed us to see the movement that was occurring during micropile installation. This allowed us to reassess our design assumptions and to evaluate risk and impact to the project and to make an informed and thoughtful decision to stop the work and change directions in an appropriate way to manage the agency's risk. Boy, it's too bad you're not passionate about the work you do. <laughs> <laughs> you see why I brought her. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Yeah, she, cares, she cares a lot about it. She yep. does. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, so it sounds as though we caught something and we are able to reuse some of those materials, which is a plus. And we have a process and a protocol that we're working on developing to make sure that we get ahead of some of these challenges that we're experiencing. Is that a, okay, That's well a done. Good summary. Yeah, we, um, you know, we will not be without errors as an agency. And I think the only way that, the only time that we ever really fail is when we don't learn and we repeat mistakes. And so uh, I just have to tell you, I'm thrilled that you are on the team because, um, wow, <laughs> it's a lot of information and, um, but it is costly. It is, um, you know, gets to the safety piece too, but also that public perception of wastefulness. And um, it's critical that we get ahead of those issues. Great, thank you. Yes. Other comments? So um, sh that was really the rally cry for, um, the first, do you want to take him as a block or you want us to just, we better, well, let's strike while it's hot. Let's go, okay. <laughs> so I would welcome a motion for um, the Farley slide and. Um, We're doing one by one. Go I ahead. believe, uh, Chair Bainey, I believe you can take this agenda item O as a block, the redistribution, take, the so cancelization of, of Farley slide okay. and okay. redistribution of the Okay, funds. go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I request approval to amend the 2018-2021 uh, statewide transportation improvement program to cancel the Interstate 84 Farley Slide project and reallocate the remaining $3,371,367 to Interstate 205 Stafford Road to 99 East project, create a project Interstate 205 Stafford Road to 99 East in the amount of $6,200,000 for equipment purchase and construction of intelligent transportation systems and to combine the Interstate Operations Improvement Construction Project and, and, and the new project, Interstate 205 Stafford Road to 99 East, Package C, 
and to move $838,453 from the Region 1 Reserve Project to fully fund equipment and construction of the new Interstate 205 Stafford Road 299 East Package C project. Excellent. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Mr. Sipp, it's Region 5's day. Yes, it is. <laughs> <clears throat> Right, again, Craig Sipp, Region 5 Eastern Oregon Manager. All those um, in favor? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, take it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, switching a little bit, this is a, a project on ID4. It's on the other side of Legrand, between Legrand and Baker, and it's Lad Canyon project. So, the, basically, I'm here to, for an amendment to increase the Lad Canyon Freight Improvement Project from $25,282,248 to $34,782,248. This project was bid on August 30th, 2018, with five bids received. The lowest bid came in 23% over the available budget for the project. Um, the, we performed a bid analysis review. It was performed by both ODOT's uh, project lighting and the regional design staff to determine if there were material errors in the contract bidding documents. From this analysis, it was determined that the bidding was done with accurate design and material quantities. With that review and the competitive nature of this procurement, with only 1.5% separating between the first and second bidders, uh, ODOT concluded that this was a valid bid and would not benefit from a redesign effort. The increase in cost appears to be the recent escalation in bid prices due to increased asphalt oil prices and constricted construction labor supply. A quick example of what I think what we've seen here uh, for a large portion of that was just this last month on another paving project in, in Region 5, Eastern Oregon, we had um, in the Mountain Free Water is we have an asphalt escalation process and, and the oil prices have been increasing sharply just within the last few months. Last month we had an asphalt escalation. This is additional cost to the project to account for the, the wide variance of oil prices. We paid an additional 330000 in one month uh, just in oil prices, and we're anticipating and for the month of September that will be around 250000 uh, for that project. Wow. So the impact of that project is we will make the constraints within that project and, and make adjustments to it. But that gives you kind of feel. And so I think what happens, we put a, we put an estimate together, we lock in, we review it, goes to Salem, or Salem does an independent review for engineer's estimate. And then from that time to, to when we actually bid the project, and this had, this is a fairly complex, complicated project with several elements to it, the asphalt prices continued to rise. And so that was well over two, two and a half million increase that we saw as a result just between that short period of time. Then also, I think just from the workforce, uh, the, as we've been talking about for a long time, is this this, this is a two-year multi-construction project. Getting good qualified uh, staff out there and workers of all the trade elements is, is difficult, and I think there's higher cost associated. And that's what we've seen was not being able to identify any specific bid item, but more just across the general of the whole project of all the bid items identified that that cost was an increased exponentially among that. So that's why we saw such a large difference um, for this specific project, mm -hmm. uh, the differences there. A little bit about the project. The project will add a third lane to accommodate tracks up I-84, uh, just east of Legrand, in a steep grade section. This often becomes a bottleneck for freight and frequently freeway closures, especially in the winter when trucks can block the existing two lanes. Adding a third lane has proven very effective in reducing highway closures in mountainous sections of eastern Oregon, including Cabbage Hill and Spring Creek Grade. Our key focus is to provide a safe and reliable transportation system that connects people and helps Oregon communities and the economy thrive. So again, this is a very important um, adding this third lane for our freight movement and keeping goods and services moving throughout the year. The project will do this by helping reduce the frequent winter closures on I-84 in Light Canyon. It is ODOT's recommendation that we proceed with the project by reallocation funds from other projects and programs to resolve the culvert safety and pavement needs in Lad Canyon. So, and I can answer any questions you may have. Uh, I would just, I think, underscoring we have historic unemployment and we have historic funding. Yeah. And so we have both city, county, state trying to put projects on the ground and we are all trying to find the same qualified, talented individuals to be able to deploy those projects and get them um, 
completed. So, I, right, and so I, I think it's just a recognition to continue to remind us, but I think we're probably going to see this for a bit. Nine million just doesn't buy what it used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I would uh, request the approval of an amendment to the 2018 21 statewide transportation improvement program to increase funding for the construction phase of Interstate 84 Lad Canyon Freight and Culver Improvement Project from $25,282,248 to $34,782,248. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those in, uh, motion carries, sorry. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's a successful day for Region 5. <laughs> A lot of safety projects. It's good to see that happen. We have already completed the consent agenda. So with that, I would just say to Commissioner O'Halloran, what an absolute joy it has been to work with you. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. And hopefully you can join us in October. But please feel free to drop by anytime. And uh, we may just come and visit you at the port every now and again just to make sure you have the appropriate snacks and Likewise, oversight. I've, I've already added you to the no-fly list. If you have any, any, any difficulty getting through really security, don't call me. So, I love it. No, um, but anyway, thank you very much. It's been my honor and privilege. Okay. Well, we are, in other words, Sean, in my case, no chance. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we are adjourned.